Yes, thank you. A very good evening from the Delhi School of Economics, University of Delhi. On behalf of the Delhi School of Economics, I extend a warm welcome to all of you to the webinar and discussion session on COVID-19 pandemic and revival strategies of global and BRICS economies. This event is being organized under the umbrella of the BRICS Network University yes. by the Delhi School of Economics, University of Delhi, the which is the lead about. institution, in collaboration with the Indian Statistical Institute, Delhi Center, the partner institution. This program is a part of engagements that India is hosting in the education stream as chair of BRICS. I am honored and privileged to welcome Sri Amit Khare, Secretary, Ministry of Education, and extend our deep regards to him. I also warmly welcome Professor P.C. Joshi, Vice Chancellor, University of Delhi, and thank him for gracing the occasion. I am delighted to welcome Professor Geeta Gopinath, Chief Economist, IMF, our distinguished keynote speaker, and also alumnus of Delhi School of Economics. It is my pleasure to warmly welcome the chairperson for the session on BRICS economies, Dr. Petya Kovabru, Deputy Director, Research Department, IMF, and the speakers from each of the BRICS economies, Professor Chetan Ghate from Indian Statistical Institute, Delhi Center, India, Professor Bruno De Conte from University of Campinas, Brazil, Professor Grigoria from Higher School of Economics, Russia. Professor Makram El Shagi from Henan University, China. And Professor Harun Borat from University of Cape Town, South Africa. It is also my pleasure to welcome all the participants from across the globe. Thanks to all for joining today. It is my privilege and honor to introduce our distinguished speakers in the inaugural session and request them to address the participants. Professor P.C. Joshi is currently Vice Chancellor of University of Delhi. He is also a member of the National Coordination Committee for BRICS Network University activities in India. He was the head of the Department of Anthropology before he became Pro-Vice Chancellor of the University of Delhi in June, 2020. He is the recipient of various honors and awards and is the current president of the Society for Indian Medical Anthropology, Mysore. He has published widely in diverse fields, including medical anthropology, traditional medicines, impact of disasters, and lifestyle diseases. Professor Joshi, we are delighted to have you with us today and request you to address the participants. Thank you. Respected Professor Pami Dua, Director, Delhi School of Economics, Honorable Sri Amit Kareji, Secretary, Minister of Education, and distinguished guests and experts from all over the all over BRICS countries. I am pleased to report that the University of Delhi is one of the 12 participating institutions from India that are part of BRIC network universities. It is also a matter of pride that the University of Delhi is a lead institution in the domain of economics. The Department of Economics is the oldest and biggest department of Delhi School of Economics and is widely considered to be one of Asia's leading centers of excellence in postgraduate teaching and research. It is internationally renowned for imparting high quality academic training in economics with the coursework and academic standards comparable to the best in the world. In keeping with the tradition of excellence, faculty members of the Department of Economics publish widely in reputed journals. They have also written several books, working papers, and are actively involved in various research projects. It is notable 
that based on its research profile, the department has for many years ranked the highest among economics departments in India by the REPEC, which is a global electronic archive of working papers and publications in economics. It also merits mention that around 40 colleges in the University of Delhi offer the undergraduate honors degree in economics. The academic coursework at the UG level is overseen by the department. The umbrella institutions of the Department of Economics, the Delhi School of Economics with its constituent departments, economics, geography, and sociology is a premier postgraduate institution of academic excellence in India and Asia. It was established in 1949 as a center for advanced learning and research in the social sciences with India's first Prime Minister, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, as its president and Professor V. K. R. V. Rao as its founder director. The main building of the Delhi School of Economics, which now houses the Department of Economics, was inaugurated by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru on January 18, 1956. Besides Professor V. K. R. V. Rao, the inaugural function was also attended by the first Vice President of India, Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan, who was also the Chancellor of the University of Delhi and later served as the second President of India. Thus, the school was inspired by great visionaries from the very beginning. It was therefore natural that it would move towards the highest level of excellence. The founder director of the Delhi School of Economics, Professor Rao, guided its development from 1949 to 1957 before becoming the vice chancellor of the University of Delhi in 1957. Beside Professor Rao, Professor B. N. Ganguly and Professor K. N. Raj from the department also served as vice chancellors of the university. As such, the University of Delhi with a glorious legacy of about a century is one of the leading universities in India. Established in 1922, the university has maintained the highest academic standards and pioneered some of the best practices in higher education. In line with its motto, Nishtha Driti Satyam, the university continues to preserve its commitment to nation building and uphold an unflinching adherence to the universal human values. The vast array of over 500 programs run by the university shows the impressive expense of knowledge creation and dissemination in the university, contributing to nation building. The university caters to over 6.4 lakh students through its 91 colleges, 16 faculties, 23 centers, three institutes, and 86 departments, making it one of the most prominent universities in the country. Research has been a significant focus area of the university. Its strong commitment to excellence in research is evident from publications of high-ranking peer-reviewed international journals, high H index that stands at 219 as per Scopus database, and a total number of 4,733 publications between 2019 2020. In addition, the university has 85 functional MOUs with various international universities from several countries all around the globe. The University of Delhi has been declared as institute, institution of eminence by the Ministry of Education. In addition, the National Assessment and Accreditation Council has accredited it with a CGPA score of 3.28 with an A grade, A plus grade in its first cycle. The university aims to continue to endeavor to achieve higher level of excellence, be a pioneer to our catering to the changing needs of society and thus continue to contribute to nation building constructively. Participation in the BRICS network university is one such step towards attaining excellence through international collaboration in teaching and research. With these words, I welcome all the distinguished experts from all over the world, especially our experts coming 
from the BRICS countries to virtually to this great university, University of Delhi. Namaskar and welcome. Thank you very much, Professor Joshi, for an enlightening address. It is now my honor and privilege to introduce Sri Amit Khare. Sri Amit Khare is Secretary, Higher Education, Ministry of Education, with additional charge of Secretary, Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. He is currently Chair of the National Coordination Committee for BRICS Network University Activities in India. He is an Indian Administrative Service Officer, 1985 batch of Jharkhand cadre. He is a graduate from St. Stephen's College, University of Delhi, and postgraduate in Business Administration from IIM Ahmedabad. He has several years of experience in the fields of finance and education. Amongst other positions, he has served as Principal Secretary and additional Chief Secretary Finance and Planning Department, Jharkhand. He also served as Secretary, Human Resource Development, Secretary, Information and Public Relations Department, Jharkhand, and Principal Secretary to Governor, Jharkhand, as well as Vice Chancellor of Ranchi University. He also served as Secretary, School Education and Literacy. Sri Khare, we are indeed honored and delighted by your presence and request you to please address the participants. P.C. Joshi, Director of uh, DSC, Professor Pami Dua, keynote speaker for today, Professor Gita Gopinath, all distinguished academics who have joined us from various BRICS nations. It is indeed a privilege to be with you, more so as an alumnus of the prestigious Delhi University, which is hosting the event today. I have a long written speech, which I don't intend to deliver in view of shortage of time, and I'm sure we would like to hear the keynote speaker. Let me start by saying that Delhi University has taken a very good step. Quite often when we discuss collaboration amongst BRICS countries, somehow our focus remains mostly on the projects in the STEM areas. The IITs, the Indian Institutes of Science, the various scientific research institutions, we discuss about their collaboration and it is indeed a matter of great satisfaction for me that we are now exploring collaboration in various areas relating to the social sector, to economy, to the global impact of the pandemic and so on. Indeed, I must thank Professor Dua, the director of DSC for organizing this webinar. Friends, India is chairing uh, uh, the BRICS uh, group this year. We had a meeting of the general body of the BRICS NU in the month of June, the last week of June, followed by senior officers meeting and again by the education ministers meeting, which was hosted by India. And all through, one factor which emerged very clearly was that all countries, particularly the BRICS nations, should invest in the field of education. This time of pandemic is a challenge for all of us. And this challenge has to be met not only by increasing our expenditure on the health services, but also by ensuring equitable distribution of resources and coming out with strategies to ensure continuance of education throughout our nations. India has taken a big leap forward after a gap of almost 34 long years. We were able to announce the National Education Policy 2020 on 29 July, 
We have just completed a year of that new education, national education policy. A policy which is rooted in Indian culture, but which has a global outlook. And some of the major initiatives that we have in that policy includes a new system of using technology, technology enabled education, an academic bank of credit, which allows mobility of students from one institution to another, twining arrangements with the foreign universities. In fact, uh, we are having further meetings with the presidents of the universities later this month to further encourage the international mobility of students and faculty so that we can learn from each other's experience. And also in light of the emerging economy, the tight silos that we used to have of humanities versus science, those have been given away. And now we have multidisciplinary education, a more liberal education where the student is free to exercise her or his choice. Having said this, I must say that the universities in India, particularly the prestigious central universities like University of Delhi have been the torch bearer in bringing about this change. I'm sure the webinar that we are having today will lead to further collaboration. We have various schemes which encourage faculty exchange, which encourage uh, joint research. In fact, the National Research Foundation on the pattern of NSF of the United States of America, which has been announced in the national education policy, on our insistence, that is the insistence of the education ministry, the National Research Foundation in India includes not only the scientific or the technological areas, but also it focuses on the social sciences. So I'm sure this combination that we have will definitely lead to far more collaboration and cooperation amongst the BRICS countries. I wish all success to the webinar and once again, congratulate the organizers, particularly Professor Pami Dua and uh, the Vice Chancellor, Professor PC Joshi, and also extend my hearty welcome to another alumnus of the great university, Professor Gita Gopinath, who is with us here today. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Thank you very much, uh, Sri Amit Kare, for your insightful address. Thank you also for finding the time to join us today in this very special occasion for the Flix Network University. So this brings us to the closing of the inaugural session. I thank both the speakers again, Professor P.C. Joshi and Sri Amit Kare, and we hope that in another opportunity, we can have much longer speeches from both of you and try to learn from both of you. Thank you very much. We now begin the second session, a keynote address by Professor Geeta Gopinath on impact of COVID-19 on the global economy. Nice. I am delighted and honored to welcome and introduce Professor Geeta Gopinath. Dr. Geeta Gopinath is the economic counselor and director of the research department at the International Monetary Fund. She is on leave from Harvard University's economics department, where she is the John Dwanstra Professor of International Studies and of Economics. Professor Gopinath's research focuses on international finance and macroeconomics and has been published in many top economics journals. She has served as the co-editor of the American Economic Review and managing editor of the Review of Economic Studies. She has also served as the co-director of the International Finance and Macroeconomics Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research and as member of the Economic Advisory Panel of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. She also served as a member of the Eminent Persons Advisory Group on G20 Matters for India's Ministry of Finance. Professor Gopinath is an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and also of the Econometric Society. The Indian government awarded her the Pravasi Bharatiya Samman the highest honor conferred on overseas Indians. 
She received her PhD in economics from Princeton University in 2001 after earning a BA from Lady Shiram College and MA degrees from Delhi School of Economics and University of Washington. Professor Gopinath, I warmly welcome you to your alma mater. You have about 30 minutes for your presentation, after which we will open the floor for questions. All participants are requested to mute their mics. And if they want to ask questions, they should enter their questions in the chat box and we will address them after the session. So thank you. Over to you, Professor Gita Gopinath. Thank you, uh, Professor Pamiduad. Thank you for the kind introduction. It is indeed uh, an honor, privilege, and a, a really happy thought to be uh, virtually back at the Delhi School of Economics and uh, addressing this, uh, this audience. And it was also a pleasure to listen to uh, Mr. Ahmed Kare, who's the Secretary of Education, and Professor P.C. Joshi, the Vice Chancellor of Delhi University. Uh, thank you. So uh, my colleague, Petya Koeva Brooks, who's Deputy Director uh, in the Research Department at the IMF, is here moderating the rest of the session. So, you know, she's an absolutely outstanding economist and a phenomenal colleague. So you're in very good hands. I have a presentation that I am going to share. Um, so let me just do that. Okay, so I assume everybody can see this. Let me jump in. Uh, there, you know, there are uh, some events in our lives that is life altering and economy altering. And of course, all countries are living through that uh, at this point. Uh, I will focus on the global picture with, uh, you know, broad messages that come out for different regions of the world. Uh, and then of course, you will be going into a deep dive of the uh, BRICS nations from the uh, eminent uh, speakers that follow me. So let me quickly jump in. This first slide of mine gives you an overview of what we are seeing from the IMF. We have 190 member countries who we, uh, we follow very closely and what kinds of economic developments are happening there. And so we put out our new World Economic uh, Outlook update uh, at the end of July. And the basic message was that world growth for this year, for 2021, is projected to be 6%. Uh, and then it's projected to be 4.9% growth for 2022 for the global economy. So these are very large growth numbers. Uh, they're coming off a contraction of the global economy when they uh, last year, a very severe contraction. But again, the global economy as a whole is, is rebounding. But the main story here, uh, unfortunately, is one of very diverging speeds of recoveries. So as you can see in the, the left two charts, that while we have no revision for the global economy in the sense that our forecast of 6% is what we had in April for the global economy, we have revised upwards the forecast for advanced economies and we have revised downwards the forecast for emerging markets and developing economies. So this is unfortunately the diverging recoveries. Similarly for next year, we have a much greater upward revision for advanced economies compared to emerging markets and developing economies. So that's one big snapshot picture of what the global economy looks like now. The risks are, of, are remain you know, to the downside. We have the Delta variant that is spreading all over the world and causing infections to go up. And in places where vaccine access is highly limited, which unfortunately is the case because there is highly uneven access to vaccines, this is creating you know, untold suffering in terms of health, lives lost, and in terms of uh, economic activity. Another major risk uh, is with respect to financial conditions that could tighten rapidly if 
high inflation, especially in the major economies like the US were to persist, then that could lead to a tightening of monetary policy. Uh, and, that, and that would, uh, uh, would lead to a tightening of financial conditions, which by the way, is something that so far the world has managed to escape, which does not have a global financial crisis at the same time that it's having a very big recession. In terms of the big policy actions that are needed, number one out there is to ensure global vaccine coverage. And this will require much greater international cooperation. At the country level, policies will need to be tailored to the stage of the crisis because different countries are in different stages of the crisis, again, depending upon how the pandemic is hitting them, depending upon how much vaccinations they have depending upon how, you know, how they're uh, in the composition of their economic activity, how much do they rely on tourism versus how much do they rely on manufacturing. Uh, so policies need to be tailored to the country's particular circumstances. Uh, and they need to be what we say anchored in medium term fiscal frameworks, because we're in a, at a time when countries appropriately are deploying fiscal measures in an unprecedented manner. However, to make sure that the country's fiscal situation remains sound and debt remains sustainable, you need to have a, a plan that over the medium term, which is over a four to five year horizon, how will the country be able to bring down deficits and gradually debt over time? It's not something you should be doing now, but this, it's important to have a credible plan. And the third uh, policy recommendation is very clear central bank communication because we're in a very tricky period uh, in terms of understanding what's happening with inflation, how much of it is persistent and so on. Uh, therefore, it's very important to have very clear central bank communication to kind of guide people in terms of what triggers will cause them to move interest rates. Because if you don't do that, then you could end up with premature financial tightening. So what I'm going to do in the next few slides is I'm gonna first, first show you a snapshot of macro variables that I feel tell the story about the way the world is at this point and expect to, kind of what, what are we seeing in terms of the data. Uh, then I will go into uh, the, the projections that we put out in July very quickly and then end with what are the needed policy actions. So this is, you know, given that this is first, the whole crisis, first and foremost, a health crisis, we always start with another seeing what hap what's happening on the health front. And what the left graph shows you is that relative to last year, it is in emerging markets and low income countries that we are seeing bigger surges as compared to an advanced economies, right? So we're seeing new waves in countries, especially that were much less affected last year. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of heterogeneity across countries. And one source of the widening gap is the very different access to vaccinations that we are seeing. That's what the middle graph shows you, that while advanced economies, in terms of uh, fully vaccinated uh, population, about 45%, that number for emerging markets is around close to 13%. And for low-income countries, we're talking at just about 1% of their populations being fully vaccinated. So this is the dramatic vaccine inequity, unfortunately, which remains the case despite seven months after the first vaccine shots were put in arm. Uh, and it's unfortunate because also because we know these vaccines work. So even against the newer variants, especially when it comes to severe disease and hospitalizations and deaths, which is what the right graph shows you. Uh, you, you, vaccinations are providing protection, providing significant protection and certainly are the best solutions, remain the best solutions. Secondly, what we're seeing in terms of the data so far, uh, we'll focus on the right graph, is that while we are seeing recoveries, we are seeing again, divergences. So this is what you see here on the right graph. These are what's called purchasing managers indices. It gives you a, a sense of what we're seeing in terms of growth in manufacturing and in services. It's a survey-based uh, indicator. But what you see here, again, is that for advanced economies, things are looking up much more strongly than for emerging markets and developing economies. 
what this graph shows you is that this is a truly unique recovery that we're seeing in the sense that it's not, we've had recessions in the past and we've seen patterns of recovery, but this is a very unique recovery. Again, not surprising given that the crisis itself was so unique, a pandemic crisis. So what are some of the uh, kind of the highlights in terms of the unusual nature of the recovery? So what we're seeing the left graph is basically the fact that in countries where government support, fiscal support was very large, those, you know, your, their households have very high savings rates, kind of historically high savings rates, which is generating a release of pent up demand as economies open up. At the same time, what the middle graph shows you is that you are seeing disruptions in supply chains. So we're seeing very rising shipping costs, uh, delays in deliveries, especially to the US and the Euro area. You're seeing, so you're, you're basically alongside this release of pent up demand, you have the supply uh, shocks, the supply breakdowns. And then the right graph uh, is, is what they call a beverage curve. But what it's basically showing you, and this is for the US, is that we're in this unique position where in the US you have very high job vacancy rates, but alongside you have very high levels of unemployment, right? And this is supposed to reflect a combination of factors, but again, you have this mismatch in the labor market. And all of that is fueling concerns about inflation. And you can see that if you look at the left graph, uh, if you look at advanced economies as a whole or emerging markets as a whole, headline inflation has gone up quite significantly this year. Uh, to an important extent, that's also that's driven by increases in commodity prices, which is what you see in the middle graph. But uh, you, know, you also see that in core inflation, which is inflation that strips out food and energy. You see that going up, even though it's much more moderate, you have seen a pickup in core inflation. And there is actually where you see a lot of differences across countries. So some countries core inflation has gone up much more strongly than in others. There, so the question is what, what do we make about uh, you know, this inflationary patterns in the sense that do we think this is something that's going to last over a three to four year period or do we expect it to uh, peak in 2021, die down in 2022. So we are of the view that uh, uh, an important part of this so far looks transitory in nature, which means at least by the end of 2022, you will be coming down to more normal inflation readings in several parts of the world. Again, it doesn't apply broadly. There are country specificities involved. Um, so if you look at, and, and why is that? It's because if you look at average wage earnings, uh, the growth in, in that, and this is again for the U.S., has been, uh, you know, while, while there are certain sectors where you've seen wage inflation go up, you know, to historic highs, but for overall wage growth, that's been you know, relatively within the norm. It, does, it looks less exceptional. And the reason I'm focusing here also a bit on the U.S. is because in some sense, the concern people have is whether you would see too high inflation in the U.S. that would cause cause US monetary policy to tighten, which then has very big spillovers to the rest of the world. So what happens in the US is clearly very important for all parts of the world, especially also for the BRICS nations. Uh, again, another reason why we think these uh, forces are transitory in many countries is what you see in the left graph, which is that the higher inflation numbers are being driven by inflation in goods and much less so by inflation in services which by the way is an anomaly because it usually tends to be the other way around that inflation tends to be driven more by services and goods. So this reflects the supply chain breakdowns, which again, over time should resolve itself. Uh, and importantly, what the middle figure shows you is that long run inflation expectations, which is a very important factor in determining what happened to inflation dynamics, even in the short term, uh, that inflation expectations are remain anchored. They haven't moved much uh, as uh, much in terms of, uh, you know, if you look at the horizon over five to 10 years. Now, uh, there is, I will pause and say that there is tremendous uncertainty. This is a crisis and a recovery like no other, like I said, uh, you know, we, the hope is that the supply bottlenecks will iron themselves out. 
all of that does require the pandemic to become increasingly under control all over the world, but there can always be surprises. Uh, and inflation expectations can change. It's, they are not stuck in stuck, they can move. Uh, and so for all these reasons, there is a tremendous uncertainty that you could end up with more persistent inflation than what is you know, expected in the baseline. Uh, and secondly, uh, even if it is not a persistent increase, it, inflation is a problem because it reduces the purchasing power of households. And especially if you're you know, in, in countries where you've seen food inflation go up quite significantly in low-income countries, for instance, spend a significant share of the consumption basket on food, uh, food inflation going up has a very bad effect on uh, livelihoods in terms of you know, what you're able to buy and what you're able to consume. So it is a problem that needs, needs to be addressed. Uh, but to the extent that major central banks around the world and many central banks around the world believe that the inflationary trends are transitory in nature, what we're seeing from the left graph is that central banks have kept their interest rates low. I mean, in many cases, these are historic lows. Uh, the middle graph shows you that there, there has been some withdrawal. We're starting to see in central banks, well, central banks withdrawing monetary support uh, uh, you know, in, in some countries, and that's what the middle graph shows you. Uh, and these are mostly emerging markets when you, when you look at policy rates being increased. But you also have some advanced economies like Canada and the UK who are reducing their pace of monthly asset purchases. So you're seeing a gradual pivot to the exit when it comes to monetary policy. What the right graph shows you is that is what's happening with fiscal support measures. And this is the duration of income support that's been provided. And as you uh, can see, I mean, for many emerging markets, most of the income support expired last year. Uh, and they just they just not have not been able to extend it into this year. So the difference in fiscal space has showed up as a big constraint in how much support can be provided. Overall, financial conditions, again, keeping in mind that this is one of you know was a historic recession last year, financial conditions remain fairly accommodative. You can see that in the left graph if you look at emerging market uh, borrowing spreads. They've, they've peaked in the really in the you know March time in last year, and they've come down since. Portfolio flows have returned to emerging markets, but cumulatively they still remain below the pre-crisis levels. When it comes to global trade, trade in goods has rebounded, but trade in services remains badly hit. Not surprising because borders remain closed, tourist travel. That is not is not happening anywhere close to what happened pre-pandemic. So that's the uh, that was a snapshot of what the world looks like. Again, a picture of uneven vaccine access leading to uneven paces of recovery. A picture of uneven fiscal policy support leading to uneven pace of recovery, uh, and a very unique recovery with supply breakdowns, pent up demand being released, mismatch in labor markets, which are fueling, which are creating challenges for policymakers that they haven't had to deal with in the past and inflation scares are a big part of it. So this is the, our forecast that we have, our mo most updated forecast on uh, for countries. This is, again, you see the numbers here after a historic recession of negative 3.2% in last year, Global growth is 6% and then 4.9%. The 2022 upgrade we have is driven almost, you know, to a very large extent by anticipated further fiscal support in the US um, and its spillovers to the rest of the world. For 2021, we also have an upgrade in the US. Again, additional fiscal support coming through in several advanced economies. In some cases, just faster recoveries than anticipated and more success on vaccination drives. On the other hand, for emerging markets as a whole, we have a downgrade for this year uh, of minus 0 0.4 uh, percentage points. And you know, an important part of those downgrades includes downgrades for significant downgrade for India, which came because of the catastrophic second wave. Uh, for China, also we have a slight downgrade. 
Um, and uh, but on the other hand, you do have upgrade for some countries like Brazil and Russia. Uh, some of these countries have been able to uh, handle the crisis and recover faster than anticipated. Some of them have benefited from the increase in commodity prices because they are commodity uh, exporters. So what, what does all of this data point to? What this data points to is the story of the left graph, which says that if you take the three years of 2020 to 2022, and look at what was the average, on average, hit to per capita income in these different income groupings. It says that for advanced economies, on average, over this three-year three year on average, about 2.8% loss to per capita income. If you look at emerging and developing economies, excluding China, that number goes to 6.3%. And for low-income countries, you're looking at 5.6%. So again, you know, you have emerging and developing economies that already start out with lower per capita income uh, who are getting harder hit in this crisis than uh, advanced economies are. And there's also greater scarring that's coming from it, which means that a much more persistent hit to their uh, activities, uh, to their uh, more persistent loss over time to their, to their income. And the right graph tells you that when this happens, you have a very large number that enter uh, extreme poverty and undernourishment. And again, this dangerous divergence is a big theme of, of global eco economic recovery. Okay, so now jumping in in my last minutes uh, to jump into uh, what exactly needs to be done. Again, first and foremost, it's essential to close the vaccination gaps. If you look at the left graph, uh, you know, we, and, you, and you say, well, by the end of this year, let's target that every country covers at least 40% of its population. What well, the left graph shows you that you know, there are several countries whose daily vaccination rates are good enough to get there, but there are many low-income countries and developing countries where their rates of vaccinations are such that you're not going to get anywhere, you're not going to be able to get there. So what needs to be done? Given that there's only that much supply that's going to come online this year, and there are lags in setting up facilities and, and getting the production, what we need urgently is to have countries that have surpluses in terms of how much of vaccines they have pre-purchased to donate those or to share those with uh, countries where there are severe, uh, severe scarcity. And so we estimate there are about 2 billion doses that these countries can share in, that they have in excess. And it's important to, sh to share a billion of those before the end of this year. What the right graph tells you is also that there's been an increase in trade restrictions worldwide, including on medical goods. And those have to be, uh, have to be removed so that there can be a greater production happening and also for vaccines to flow across borders. We put out the IMF, we put out a staff discussion note uh, which was a proposal to end the COVID-19 pandemic, which set out seven key actions that were needed to end the pandemic. It's a very busy slide. I'm not going to read over those. But the basic point is that since the two months since that was put out, there have been some substantial progress, which is funding, for instance, for COVAX that's been done. You have partial progress in terms of donations. So for instance, there are about... Uh, 500 million doses that are expected to be delivered in 2021, which is about 50% of the desired amount of 1 billion. But then, and then there are others where there's almost been little to no progress. And this is on everything else, which is not vaccine, but also hugely important, which is diagnostics, PPE and therapeutics, uh, vax, uh, country preparedness. There's a little progress, much less progress has been made. A joint task force was set up by the, by the IMF, the World Bank, the WHO and WTO to accelerate progress on, on these actions. And we have a new dashboard and a new website that I would recommend that you take a look at. Uh, second is that countries will have to, uh, you know, will, are in, in policymakers are in this challenging situation where they will need to, because we're not out of the crisis, that they will need to continue to provide support while dealing with concerns about inflation and uh, 
you know, just limits to how much fiscal space they have. So again, what the left graph shows you is that for many countries, headline inflation is well above their inflation target. What the middle graph shows you is that for advanced economies, that doesn't, you know, the markets are not pricing in interest rates going up anytime soon in, or in any dramatic fashion, which is the blue line. But if you look at the red line, you can see that markets are pricing in that interest rates will go up quite significantly in emerging markets, returning back to pre-pandemic levels pretty quickly. So uh, that itself starts tightening financial conditions for emerging markets and uh, you know, puts a headwind to their recovery. The right graph again shows you the amount of fiscal support that uh, we estimate is in the pipeline for advanced economies versus emerging markets versus low-income countries. As you can see for 2020, overwhelmingly advanced economies did a whole lot more than emerging and developing economies did. But importantly, you know, they're able to maintain, they, are keeping that up pretty much in 2021. While for emerging markets and low-income countries, you can see the blue portion of those uh, verticals that that's just shrinking. So uh, the, uh, there's less support available, available there. And there is uh, an important, uh, you know, a, a risk that we highlight for emerging developing economies, which we call it, you know, as a double knock, which is one that because they don't have insufficient vaccinations, that the pandemic hits them very hard. And combined with that, suppose you have very strong recoveries and you have inflation persisting in the US that leads to interest rates going up faster than expected, then that can tighten financial conditions globally. And that can have a big hit to uh, emerging markets. So that's one of the scenarios that we, we simulate about what might happen in a downside case to a, a new infection wave in emerging markets and faster monetary policy normalization in advanced economies. And that can have a very large effect on emerging markets, as you can see from the red line over there. The middle graph shows you that the world is in this together and that if you don't vaccinate the world, you're going to end up with new variants that will you know, you know, risk the fact that you, know, you would need very high levels of coverage, 90% or more, to get to any kind of uh, you know, herd immunity in advanced economies. And you could see cases going, and, you know, but, and that might be very hard to achieve because of vaccine hesitancy. So again, the middle graph shows you a case where you have a very highly transmissible variant that comes up. The vaccines remain effective, but because of vaccine hesitancy, you just don't get the levels of coverage that you need. And that can also then have an effect on, for, on economic activity, which reduces GDP for both in emerging markets and advanced economies. Recently, uh, the IMF proposal to do a new SDR allocation of $650 billion was accepted, was, has been accepted by the governors and agreed on by the governors. And so that's going to be deployed towards the end of this month. Uh, and that should provide all of IMF member countries with additional reserves so that they can deal with the liquidity risks of the kind that I'm just talking about, uh, and also to help them deal with the difficult trade-offs they have right now in recovering from this crisis. Another major uh, policy action, policy issue, okay, I should, oh, I should mention this and that, you know, in terms of what needs to be done here, given the picture that we're seeing, it is important for emerging markets and BRICS nations included uh, to, again, to, to preemptively uh, you know, take care of, of what needs to be done if, if a situation like this arises. So what can you specifically do? One is if you extend the maturities at which you are borrowing, so you're less affected if you have tantrums. Uh, and secondly, that again, just to reiterate the point I made at the beginning, which is to have a sound fiscal framework, a credible fiscal framework, so that you can, you know, you can anchor that as clear expectation that your fiscal situation will be in order over the medium term. Uh, and that can again separate you from other countries that might get hit by taper tantrum kinds of uh, episodes. In term, policy should also ensure inclusive uh, recoveries. Uh, and allow for reallocation of resources. So what the left graph shows you is that, it, you know, for many, for emerging advanced economies and emerging developing economies as a whole, young workers, low-skilled workers have been harder hit in terms of their levels of unemployment. Uh, 
We're seeing ch that change now with when countries that are reopening. But again, it's important that policies keep in mind that it's not just the overall headline unemployment number, but what's happening for different uh, demographics is also very important. In emerging and developing economies, women, for instance, have been are, remain much harder hit based on the data we have so far. Uh, and that is again, an area that needs to be addressed. What we also see is that we're seeing an acceleration towards automation coming out of this crisis, which means that people who work in sectors that are easily, can be easily automated, are much likely to have longer durations of unemployment. Uh, and therefore it's important, again, policies are provided in terms of worker training, job training, skill training, to be able to match to sectors, growing sectors. Uh, the right graph basically said, you know, we, we're coming out of a period where because of moratoria on loan payments and mortgage payments and so on, you can you have many households and, and firms uh, that you might find themselves that as these measures are removed, that they have a problem repaying their, their debt. Uh, and the way to resolve, I mean, you have, there are many possible measures, including providing equity like support. But it's also very important to have uh, procedures, insolvency procedures that are timely uh, so that you can end up with faster reallocation of capital. And you can see that there is what the right graph shows you is that there's quite a bit of heterogeneity in among countries and how long it takes to resolve uh, insolvencies. And this is my last slide that I'm going to stop with. Another important policy action that's needed is that as countries recover and invest in the recovery, given that we face another major uh, existential crisis, which is the climate crisis, that it's important to invest in green recoveries. What the left graph shows you is that so far in terms of recovery spending, only about 18% of that has been on low carbon activities. And there are certainly some countries that can do more on that front at the IMF, we believe strongly that a carbon price is the most efficient and effective way to uh, reduce carbon emissions. And having a agreed upon global minimum carbon price will make that uh, easier to accomplish. And I, I will end with a note on education that seems appropriate given, given the seminar, which is a major issue is the big hit to education, and especially in countries, in low-income countries and in emerging markets and in developing economies where remote learning is not, you know, just is either infeasible, not feasible, or it just doesn't do, you know, it's just much harder uh, to, um, to, to keep up the, the, the pace of teaching and, and, and education and learning that's needed. So there, are, there is a whole generation of students who have been hit over this last year and a half in terms of learning. And that's where government resources also need to go to invest in education, to ensure that this can be remedied. Otherwise you're going to end up with the workforce of the future, which is not uh, productive uh, for the growth needs of the country. Okay, so with that, I am going to, oh, I actually, I have a couple of policy slides which are pretty much in detail, but it kind of summarizes some of the things that I just said, uh, which is that again, in terms of major actions needed, you need strong international cooperation with the goal of vaccinating at least 40% in every country by the end of this year and at least 60% by the end of next year. That requires at least 1 billion doses to be shared with developing countries this year. About 500 million has been pledged you know, but we still need another 500 million and we need the deliveries to happen. Uh, we need additional international cooperation is also needed on debt profiling and debt restructuring, on resolving trade and technology tensions uh, and reforming international corporate taxations. The, again, the 650 billion US dollar supplemental reserves should help countries achieve their goals. In terms of country level policies, Again, if you are in the acute phase of the crisis, you should prioritize health spending uh, and target support for affected households and firms. When you are, if you're sufficiently vaccinated, 
and you're durably exiting the crisis, you want to secure the recovery, and you want to allow resources to move labor and capital to move to sectors that are growing. Um, and you have to invest in the future, which, is, which will require expanding, first of all, fiscal capacity, anchoring it in credible medium term fiscal frameworks, because um, you will need that to boost production capacity, including accelerating the transition to low carbon dependence, harnessing benefits of digitalization, strengthening social safety nets, improving education and worker training. Okay, let me just um, stop with that. Thanks a lot, Professor Gopinath, for a very stimulating and informative, informative presentation. Uh, we have time for a few questions. We have received some questions from our Zoom participants, and we have also received questions from our live streaming. So I'll uh, start with the first question. This is from Anisha Chitgupi. While there are supply chain disruptions on account of the pandemic, US had already began decoupling from China. How can emerging markets attract the shifting corporations and FDI and capital flows, given they are lagging behind in vaccinations and vulnerable to future waves of infections? Thank you. Uh, so firstly, in terms of the facts, you are correct that you had trade tariffs going up between the US and China pre-pandemic. And that was certainly affecting trade in certain goods. But if I step back and look at the overall picture in terms of global trade, uh, it's fair to say that global trade in goods at least has rebounded quite significantly uh, after the short-term collapse it had last year. So global trade, you know, to, I think it's a bit early to come arrive at the conclusion that trade flows and trade patterns are going to shift in any dramatic way uh, after this pandemic. It's, we, it's not something that we're seeing uh, at this point. You certainly have supply disruptions uh, for, some, for, some, for some kinds of products, especially for instance, in car production. It's a big problem has been semiconductor sh chip shortages. So there's some, there are some very specific areas where you're seeing that. There is a push to then diversify production in different countries, including the US is pushing for that. So again, as a, as a picture of, do I, my, do I believe that we are seeing some major shifts in trade patterns and in terms of overall global trade? I don't, that is not the picture that I see right now. I, I think countries absolutely will make decisions about where to source, there will be changes in that. There will be uh, a desire to onshore some of the production to locate across different countries. And countries can prepare for that, but for the same way that you would prepare for being competitive in international markets, which is having very scalable manufacturing capacity, being able to do just-in-time production, high levels of efficiency, uh, uh, you know, infrastructure to make sure that you can get goods to ports very quickly. All of that will will be, uh, you know, it's the same set of things that would help. But yes, as long as you have the pandemic and you have restrictions and it's difficult for people to be working in large numbers in ports and so on, there's going to be disruptions. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from our live streaming. Can a STR allocation help overcome the crisis in emerging market economies? Oh, it is. Uh, you know, the SDR allocation, which again was just recently agreed by the governors of the, uh, of the IMF, uh, is up to amount of $650 billion, uh, gives countries uh, additional reserves tied to the amount of their quota share. So there's, it varies across countries, but every country receives additional reserves, which first of all, helps them lead, you know, lead sorry, deal with risks that may be coming up in the horizon. So they have reserve buffers. It's like a rainy day fund. You have money there for it. So those reserves are, are useful for you to deal if things go bad, but also to, you know, to use it to deal with the difficult challenges that you're facing now in terms of the trade-offs of, you know, the spending that you have to do on uh, healthcare, necessary spending that you have to do on livelihoods. I mean, all of that, it, it is again, a, a supporting mechanism that helps, helps country deal with it. So yes, it 
provide support, I think it's going to be, it will have an even greater impact if uh, some of the advanced nations that get an important big share of these SDRs rechannel those SDRs to poorer nations. If that happens, that rechanneling happens, then that can be that can amplify the effect of this initial SDR allocation. And that's something that we are working at uh, at the fund, working on at the fund. Thanks for the lucid explanation. Uh, next question is from Aditya Tanwar. Given an extreme spike in commodity prices and wholesale price index, there has been divergence between WPI and CPI. Is it possible that the production sector may have absorbed the spike in commodity prices and may transfer it onto the consumer in the medium term, potentially causing an upward pressure on CPI in the medium term? So that, that is certainly a, a risk that is, it is there and that varies across countries. So the amount of pass-through of commodity prices to CPI inflation, and especially, you know, of course, headline inflation includes food and energy, so there's the direct effect that comes on it. But let's take those out and let's focus on core CPI, which is excluding those categories. The pass-through of commodity prices into core CPI inflation varies quite considerably across countries. Now, commodity prices are famously volatile, I mean, and we know that, and there can be persistent cycles, but we're living in some very volatile period at this time, at this point. So the question is whether we see this translate into core CPI inflation, into you know, otherwise you know, non-commodity prices. And that depends also a lot on inflation policy in countries. It depends upon what's happening with inflation expectations and so on. Uh, but indeed, if you know, the, the, you could, one could think of a scenario where elevated commodity prices uh, you know, including pipe price prices, you know, petrol prices that you see, uh, when they start going up, that raises people's expectations about inflation, even if it's only one component of their budget. Uh, and then that starts feeding into higher wage demands, and then that feeds into overall inflation. So that's the kind of risk that one, one uh, needs to be uh, careful about. Thanks. Uh, that brings clarity to the question. So that was a wonderful way of explaining it. Now, next question is from Abhishek Bansal. During the pandemic, amount of inequality around the world has increased to record high levels, according to a few studies. How can this situation be tackled across the world? It has certainly led to insecurity among the middle section or poorer sections of the world. So we've seen an increase in inequality both within countries and across countries. So I, in my presentation, I talked about this dangerous divergence across countries, but also within countries, we're certainly seeing uh, important gaps. This is why I showed you about young workers, women, low-skilled workers being particularly hard hit. Uh, and we've seen uh, the divergence comes from it, increase in extreme poverty. So in terms of what uh, is needed, I would say, of course, I think starting with first and foremost, we want to end this crisis, we want to end it everywhere. That would start with ending the pandemic, which requires widespread vaccination. So if we can get much bigger shares of the world population vaccinated, countries can reopen uh, safely. And that itself, that kind of a resumption of economic activity in and of itself helps all of these people we get come back into the labor market, get their jobs, get their livelihoods, right? So I would say that, that would be first a, a huge priority. Second, of course, countries will have to ensure that they use fiscal resources to provide necessary transfers to vulnerable households, vulnerable small and medium enterprises, because otherwise you're gonna end up with a whole lot of scarring for the future and, and it's just bad for, for medium and long-term outcomes. Education spending, again, hugely important. Unfortunately, the children who have been hardest hit are the ones who come from poorer backgrounds. Uh, and so absolutely focused remedial action on that front is absolutely essential to again, close uh, the gap. I mean, we've seen children leaving basically, you know, the risk of permanently exiting education. I mean, that is a huge uh, problem uh, and that needs uh, to be addressed. Again, going forward, countries need to have 
health systems in place that can deal with crises of this kind. From an international community's perspective, again, among the many different things, the SDR allocation helps. We have um, debt forgiveness for debt relief and debt forgiveness that would be needed for some countries. So all of these different actions um, are needed. Right. Uh, we have a number of questions, but uh, I'll have to limit the number of questions here. So I'll take one more. Uh, this is from uh, Pooja Sharma. Uh, thank you for such a comprehensive presentation. Would like to know about your views on universal basic income in these times of pandemic, specifically for developing countries. So, I mean, the idea of giving transfers to poorer households has been around for a long time. The question is whether you want it to be truly universal. Uh, and what that literally means is that everybody, including the wealthiest person in the, in the country, gets a check from the government. And I'm, you know, I'm not sure whether that's a, that is a, it's a huge, very expensive proposition and it's certainly not the best targeting of resources uh, at this point. Though, you know, the argument would be that it has the benefits of not distorting anybody's actions. But again, that said, I think the idea is setting aside the universal part of the universal basic income, but the, but the idea that uh, a basic level of income to house to people, you know, who are below a certain income threshold, uh, the studies, the research at least points to the fact that that has huge benefits and very little negatives. I mean, the concern, you know, there, are con there were concerns associated with giving this kind of income, but I think at least the evidence that we have so far says that it, you know, giving this kind of income support doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, deter people from going to work, it, at least at the levels at which it was, has been given, it doesn't deter people from going to work. And so, yes, I think a basic, basic income to ensure that people have a chance of, of moving up the ladder in life is, is for, again, certain targeted people are, is important. Thank you very much, Professor Gopinath, uh, for your wonderful session, for a very dynamic interaction, and also for meeting with us virtually. I do hope that you will be able to visit us physically in the near future. So I look forward to that. So thank you from all of us at Delhi School of Economics, as well as from the Indian Statistical Institute. Now, thank you. Thank uh, you, Professor Dua. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. We now begin the discussion session on uh, COVID-19 pandemic and revival strategies of BRICS economies. I now hand over to Professor Surinder Kumar, head of the Department of Economics, and request him to introduce the chairperson of this session, Dr. Petya Kova Brooks. After that, uh, Dr. Brooks can take over the session and have the panel's discussion speakers. Thank you. So over to you, Professor Surinder Kumar. So thank you, Professor Dua, and very welcome to this second part of this session. And I'm very delighted to introduce to you Dr. Patya Koiva Brooks. Dr. Brooks is the Deputy Director in the Research Department of the International Monetary Fund, IMF. In this capacity, she leads the work of multilateral surveillance, including the IMF flagship World Outlook. Previously, she was deputy director in the IMF strategy, policy, and review SPR department, overseeing the design and implementation of policies related to fund lending, capital flows, and IMF collaboration with regional financial arrangements. Earlier, she was the chief of the emerging market division in SPR during the period 2012-15. Dr. Brooks was in the European Department at the Mission Chief for Italy and was in charge of the unit responsible for Euro area surveillance. During this period of 2009-12, she was the head of the World Economic Outlook Division in the Research Department. Prior to that, she was the Mission Chief for Iceland in 2008 and a desk economist for India, Nepal, United Kingdom, Ireland, Cyprus, Thailand, Turkey, and Euro area. And she also served various other countries in different capacities. Dr. Brooks earned her PhD from MIT. Now over to Dr. Brooks. Dr. Brooks. 
you're not audible. Ma'am, you are not audible. No, there is no answer. Photo books, you are muted. Please unmute yourself. I'm going to try again. Do you hear me now? Yeah, now it's good. Yeah, it's good. It's fine. Yes. Right. Okay, great. Um, so um, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you very much again for the kind introduction. Um, it's, uh, it's really wonderful to be a, a chair of this session. We're going to zoom in on the BRICS economies and it's very hard to think about a global recovery where we don't talk about the, uh, the BRICS economies, which at this stage account for about a third of the global economy and of the of the uh, of the growth this year, they account for about two fifths uh, of uh, of that growth. So, with us uh, to talk about the various uh, um, uh, to talk about China, India, South Africa, uh, Brazil, and Russia, we have uh, we have four panelists that I'm going to introduce uh, one at a time. The plan for the session is that we're going to have uh, each panelist is going to have 10 minutes each. And after the last one is finished, we're going to have a questions and answers session. Uh, now, uh, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce the first uh, panelist, uh, and that is Professor Chaitan Gatte who is a professor of economics uh, at the in Indian Statistical Institute in Delhi. And he has been in the ISI since two 2000. His research interests include macroeconomic theory and policy, monetary economics, and growth and development. He was a member of India's first monetary policy committee between 2016 and 2020. And he was honored with the 2014 um, Mahala Nobis Memorial Gold Medal given to the best research economist in India under the age of 45. Uh, and with that, I give you the floor. Great, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes you can. Yes, thank, you. thank you. Uh, thanks for the very interesting talks before. Um, uh, so I'm going to focus my intervention, not so much on the health side, but on India's macro policy response. Um, in, in, you know, India had two waves, uh, two major waves. Uh, the first one peaked last year in 2020, uh, at about 100,000 cases a day around uh, September. Uh, 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 and the second one, because of the, the Delta variant, which was much more uh, stringent, uh, peaked about April, May, about 400,000 plus cases a day. But 
most EMEs uh, responded to the pandemic recession in a similar way. Uh, uh, the cyclical response was divided between monetary, fiscal, and prudential. And based on how much fiscal and monetary policy space countries had, that determined what fraction of, or what proportion, if you may, of their policy stimulus was above the line and what proportion was below the line. And in India's case, all the action was below the line. So you had large liquidity injections. So the offset last year between March and May, so there was something to the quantum of about 4% of GDP. And arguably, uh, this is probably more important than uh, waiting for uh, uh, the large cut in the policy rate, which is a conventional policy cut, which many central banks did uh, because of the lack of, of, of good transmission and so on. So that, that large liquidity injection uh, ensured surplus liquidity in, in the financial system, which helped with easing financial conditions. And then borrowing from the US Fed script, where the Fed became the lender of last resort to a variety of financial and non-financial companies, um, it was really an announcement of this backstop that instilled confidence in financial markets and presented, prevented a credit crunch from, from kicking in. So most, most central banks basically you know, announced a strong insurance principle or monetary policy was governed by a strong insurance principle that policy promises are going to be large, they're going to be front-loaded rather than small and, and, and delayed. Um, and then there was a lot of stuff that was happening below the line, in addition to the announcement of the backstop, and that eased kind of the, the tension or, or, or stress in financial markets. But India, when it went into, um, into the COVID, the first hit, the lockdown last year was, was March 25, headline inflation, which is the black line here, was already elevated. It was already beginning to exceed, uh, this is the this green patch here, the 2 to 6% band. Uh, under India's current inflation targeting regime, it began to exceed 6% already in November 2019 and stayed there till March. Then in April and May, there was a break in the series because the CSO, the Central Statistical Office, couldn't gather enough data to actually calculate these rates. It continues to be, once they were able to do it, it continues to be elevated again and declines. This is the February 21, but then in the last two months, it's again gone above uh, 6%. So India came into the pandemic, into COVID, with elevated headline inflation, and that contrasts with um, the experience of the advanced economies, certainly the systemic ones, whose inflation rates were hovering between 0 and 2%. And even here, kind of, if you look at the BRICS economies between, uh, let's say, October 2019 to June 2020, no, all, these were all hovering between 1.7 and about 4%, and then post, of course, post, uh, more recently, Feb 21, they begin to diverge. Brazil and Russia have slightly higher rates at about 5.2, 5.7. Uh, China's is lower, minus 0 0.2, and South Africa is about 2.9. So India, even for, against this metric, uh, has higher, higher inflation. India also had limited fiscal policy space. So based on recent work, uh, we calculate very carefully India's general debt to GDP ratio, which is center for the state. And these are just items on the uh, Consolidated Fund of India. That's about 58% of GDP. But once you begin to incorporate items on the public account, uh, it goes up to about 78% of GDP. And separately, we've calculated that interest payments, once you take uh, 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 both the Consolidated Fund and the public account into, into account, uh, you get something to the order of 3.5% to 4% of interest, interest, interest payments as a percentage of GDP, which is very, very high. And that dwarfs. Uh, Public health spending in India, which is about 1.5 percent, education, which is about three, three and a half percent. So, so this is this is a worry. So, you know, on this on the side of the debate, whether you should worry about debt to GDP ratios or whether you should worry about interest payments to GDP, I'm on the side that you know India should worry about interest payments to GDP because once you you know once you have elevated debt levels, uh, uh, financial markets get skittish, uh, and with financial market volatility. EMEs as a whole, and maybe India specifically, will begin to see a rise in funding costs. And as Gita was saying, the EME response to the uh, pandemic recession starting last year was markedly lower. Um, this is the overall, I've got this from the IMF Fiscal Monitor, Jan 2021, was markedly lower compared to the advanced economy stimulus by 20. So it was this large fiscal stimulus, plus the fact that there was an early rollout in the vaccine that, that led their downturns to be more muted and, and their revival to be much faster. Um, but as a whole, even though India does, you know, fairly high, and I'm still trying to understand this number a, 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 a bit better, um, it is it is lower than 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 what the what the advanced economies were doing, and and therefore the the, the limited 
fiscal support that, that India gave, um, and also the fact that there was limited fiscal space because there was limited fiscal space, but also uh, limited monetary policy space led to a fairly large contraction in, in GDP. Um, so this was of the order of about 25% in Q1 2021. The revival was quite fast as the stimulus kicked in. Um, that Q2 number last year was about 7% and then it you know, moves into slightly positive. And these various colored parts of these bar graphs are C, I, G, and X minus M, of course, X minus M becomes positive because when Y falls, imports fall, exports fall by less, and then exports rise. But what, what I want, to, want you to take away from this diagram is in the eight quarters preceding the sharp downturn in growth, in real GDP growth, growth had already begun to decline. And it was, on, it was 8% Q1 2018 19, and it was about 4% in Q4 2019 20. And this, domestically, this was partly because of. Um, uh, a systemic non-banking financial company uh, not being able to repay its debt in September 2018, and then there was a series of kind of fallouts, one major housing finance company, and then a central commercial bank, and so on. And that led to, a, remember that in 2015, the central bank had an asset quality review, several central commercial banks were put on to prompt corrective action, they couldn't lend, they started lending to, to, to NBFCs, and, and so on, and the NBFCs had large asset liability mismatches, which made them vulnerable to policy hikes from the central bank. So that led to a flow of a scheduled commercial bank credit outflow to decline, and that partly impinged on, 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 on growth. And, and, and this is what's kind of important is that if you think of potential growth in India being 6% in the last decade, and I certainly think there's room to add to that, a lot of it will depend on how we, what policies we enact to uh, going forward to, to deal with the pandemic. On, on the government budget constraint, again, what worries me a little bit is, is in the four components that are in the government budget constraint. Normal interest rates, inflation, growth, and deficit. In a in a in a, a debt accounting, inflation is the largest component historically in India. So these are arbitrary nine-year periods. The first is the four-year period, but inflation deflates public debt the most. Apart from this high growth phase between 2003 and 2009, when inflation actually was trumped by growth because these were high growth years, but inflation's inflation's contribution to deficit finance is fairly large. Uh, in the Indian case, um, and, and then in terms of BRICS, and, and that you know that that's, that that high inflation is, is is a source of external vulnerability. Where I think where India stands relatively well is that it has um, accumulated, uh, uh, it has high foreign exchange reserves. Uh, unlike the taper tantrum uh, in 2013, it has a, a very small current account deficit in some in some in some quarters. It's it's been close to zero. Um, it, it's general government debt, as I just said. The GDP piece provisional um, tends to projected uh, uh, is, is is quite high, um, uh, 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 and then its growth has has contracted for 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 last year. It was uh, about seven and a half percent. It's projected to rise at a very high rate because of, of the base effect, but it is it is contracted quite a lot. But but it's in the interests of advanced economies to have the BRICS economies and the MEs grow at a fast rate. What worries me a little bit is that. The role that China played, for instance, in the great financial crisis in 2008 may not be as strong this round this time around. Now, um, what are some growth vulnerabilities? One is kind of the left hand is to be read against this dash line is, is non-food credit growth of scheduled commercial banks has been featuring for, for a while. It's beginning to flatten out and rise, but it is now gone from about 14% to 6%. In the credit GDP ratio, uh, two loans extended by scheduled commercial banks and, and corporate bonds is about 70% of GDP. Um, it needs to be higher to sustain uh, uh, higher growth rates of about 7 or 8%. Uh, the pandemic is going to, and this is a source of concern as well, is that if you look at gross non-performing assets prior to the pandemic, and then just look across public sector banks, private banks, uh, foreign banks, and all scheduled commercial banks, you see a market increase, especially in the public sector banks, which do the dominate, dominate in lending, uh, going from about 9.5% of advances to about 30.95%. And then banks have to provision more, their profits fall and they, and they lend less and so on. So this is, this is again a source of concern for credit off offtake. Trade, I, I, you know, it, as Gita was saying, it's still uncertain how tr trade is going to go, um, but it is, it is clear from, from 1990 onwards, trade's proportion to global output has become less prominent. And, that, that seems to suggest that if things continue the way they do, trade will deliver less in terms of output growth in the 2020s. 
Um, and, and then India's fiscal mix in, in terms of the composition of government expenditures has always been skewed towards um, revenue expenditures or, or current expenditures, pensions, interest payments, subsidies, and salaries. Major subsidies have gone up because of the disbursement of food under the, under the pandemic relief. Uh, 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 there was an you know, extension of food under the National Food Security Act. Interest payments will go up because the quantum of borrowing has gone up. But this is, you know, capital expenditures is about 2% of GDP here. Um, uh, this is just central uh, expenditures, states to another two, uh, central public sector enterprises is another two and a half. So that's that's about total six and a half percent, but it, it is it is small compared to uh, uh, revenue expenditures. So just to end, um, uh, I, I think what, what EMEs could do or think or talk about is thinking about you know, putting some floor on public investment. And, and there's very little careful research on how public investment impacts economic growth or potential growth, uh, not, not economic growth, potential growth, both in advanced economies and, and, and EMEs. And, and I think this is something that is worth talking about. Second, COVID is going to come in waves and, and the pace of recovery will depend on, on how fast or, or slow your, your vaccination effort is. But as long as you know, your back vaccination effort is slow, there'll be a lot of uncertainty in the economy savings will be elevated and consumption demand will be less. I think fiscal policy should definitely, it's an asymmetric shock, fractions of the population might be formal sector have been hit much, much harder. And a lot of transfers is a good idea um, because it's an asymmetric shock. And I'm going back to this issue of putting a floor on public investment, health is definitely going to be treated very differently post pandemic because countries that had higher allocations toward health and had better health systems were also ones that were far more resilient to to the COVID pandemic. So I'll just end by, by, by going back to this issue of trade. Um, India has endorsed Atman Nirbhar and the government has gone out uh, 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 to suggest that, you know, this is essentially self-reliance. It's not self-sufficiency and that self-reliance relies primarily on competition and capabilities. But if India wants foreign investment um, uh, to kickstart growth, uh, it will need to lower tariffs. Uh, and, and that's why I think it should reconsider joining uh, a, a multilateral trade agreements. RCEP is a good example. Lots of issues in RCEP, for instance, dealing with services and dairy have been worked out. There's something like 37 tariff lines. It, as long as you can establish rules of origin and in RCEP, you're, you're, you, know, you basically have zero tariffs. These are all modeled on ASEAN plus one model agreements. And I think this is a time to, to think about this for trade to your engine of growth and attract FDI not so much in the MA type, but, but in greenfield projects. And, 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 and fiscal policy should definitely be anchored in terms of the medium term framework. But I, I think this, the, the, the kind of mechanical sense in which we look at R less than G or R greater than G needs to be really thought of in terms of debt service to GDP ratio because of snowball effects and things like that. It's a very tight balancing act, but these are some of the challenges and these are possibly some of the ways forward in dealing with the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a very thought-provoking uh, pre presentation, and also it was uh, it was very nice how you put in India in the context of what was happening in the other BRICS uh, economies. Um, so now we're going to turn to the uh, to the second panelist, uh, who is Bruno De Conti, uh, and Bruno is a pro professor at the University of Economics, University of Campinas, Brazil. He is also coordinator of the BRICS Network University in the field of economics at the University of uh, Campinas. His main research areas are BRICS, the Chinese economy, and the international monetary system. He has been a visiting professor at the University of Paris, um, Universitat Autonoma de Madrid, Moscow State University of International Relations, the Free University of Berlin, as well as the Southwestern University of Finance and Economics in China. Um, please, uh, Bruno, you have the virtual floor. Thanks, Dr. Brooks. Thanks a lot for uh, the Delhi School of Economics for the organization of this very interesting webinar, namely to Professors Pami Dua and Piandu Maidi. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And it's a pleasure to share this session with some colleagues with whom we, are been, we have been working within the framework of the BRICS Network University. Let me share my screen. Here it is. 
Well, um, I was asked to talk a, a, bit, a little bit about the situation in Brazil uh, in, in this, uh, this uh, very deep and, and profound crisis uh, provoked by uh, Corona crisis. But uh, I'm, I'm going to start by saying that we cannot understand the current crisis without uh, giving some steps back and, and checking the situation of the world. And obviously, in my case, the situation of Brazil before the crisis. In my opinion, and I'm not alone on that, uh, we have to understand the crisis and its effects, uh, uh, knowing that uh, we just came from a global financial crisis which provoked a political crisis in many countries in the world uh, with populism and anti-multilateralism. And this is important for us to understand the failures of the global governance, for instance, in dealing with the current crisis, corona crisis. Uh, and then we also have uh, trying to narrow the space of discussions uh, for to arrive in Brazil. We have to understand that this crisis as Professor uh, Gita said, is especially harmful for peripheral countries. Here I bring some ideas from a report by UNCTAD, and they say that there are three axes uh, that help us to understand why uh, is it that uh, this crisis is more harmful for peripheral countries. So international trade is one of them, then the commodity prices, then international finance, and the sudden stops that we had in the peripheral countries. Uh, with uh, effects over our uh, exchange rate, for instance, with very high devaluation of the exchange rates, and then the public budget, the effects on the public budget. I would bring also some other elements in order for us to understand why this crisis is worse in the, perif in the periphery. Uh, in the chat, many persons had asked to Professor Gita about the labor market in India. And this is the case, uh, maybe in India it's worse, but I would say this informality problem is a problem of the periphery of the world. So we also have to understand that uh, the, the crisis is more harmful in the periphery of the, war, of the world due to the characteristics of the labor market. Finally, uh, and this was also mentioned not in these words, but uh, by Professor Gita, uh, we have in the periphery of the world a lower degree of autonomy for economic policy. I don't want you to read the text here, but I just brought some considerations by the Standard & Poor's about the Brazilian situation. What they were saying is that, well, okay, you are living this crisis, people are dying, but you have to return to fiscal adjustment. And they were saying that uh, in, in August last year, when we were having uh, thousands of people dying every day. So even if the IMF was claiming that uh, all countries in the world should do uh, should uh, do uh, fiscal policies in order to revamp their economies or to at least um, have a, a lower effect of the crisis on their economies. The, the, the credit rating, rating agencies, on the contrary, they were claiming that we should get back to austerity. And this is obviously quite problematic for, for the whole world. Uh, and especially for the periphery of the world, this is my claim here. Uh, then I come to Brazil, and as I said, the crisis did not start in last year with Corona crisis. We were living already an economic crisis. Here I brought some data about the estimations of economic growth in Brazil in 2019. And uh, you see that it, it was declining all, all over the year, and we finished 2019 with an economic growth of 1.1%, very low uh, uh, economic growth. A political crisis started, uh, not started, but well had uh, as a, a very important moment, the coup d'etat against Dilma Rousseff in 2016, so before the crisis as well, before the corona crisis, and then it created a total chaos in, in political terms in Brazil, That and then we had the election of Jair Bolsonaro in 2018, starting his government in 2019, as you know, I'm going to talk about Jair Bolsonaro later and obviously a related uh, social crisis. <clears throat> Bolsonaro, uh, it, it, we cannot understand what happened in Brazil uh, if you do not understand uh, his attitude as the president of, uh, of Brazil during the crisis. And he's the whole time denying the crisis. Uh, since the beginning, he was saying that, well, it's just an ordinary flu, uh, 
what can we do? People will die, but what can we do? And he's claiming that the most important thing would be uh, uh, do, do not harming the, the economy. So people will die, but we have to keep Brazil moving ahead. That's what he says, keep the economy moving ahead. So he makes uh, an effort to convince people to disobey the social distancing policy. So at the end, uh, the subnational entities, governors of states and mayors of municipalities, they were trying uh, uh, to, to do social distancing policies. And the president himself was saying that people should disobey. We had four ministers of health during the pandemic, precisely because each time one uh, minister of health who was trying to, to do a social distancing policy, then he was dismissed. Uh, and and uh, he, he was, Bolsonaro, uh, uh, stimulating militants to invade hospitals to show that they are not totally full. So he was doing, uh, well, uh, the, his policy, instead of helping, the situation was uh, disturbing those who were trying to create any kind of policy to deal with the crisis. Uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, also, uh, our former minister was the whole time claiming that uh, it was China's fault, the, the corona crisis. On purpose, China had spread the virus, so the Chinese virus and so on, following the steps of Donald Trump. So for, for our discussions regarding BRICS, it's important to know that this government is also creating fissures within BRICS. Then the result is not uh, surprising. We are the third uh, country in the world in terms of infection and the second one in terms of death. Is maybe in the next month as we can even overcome US being the first one in terms of death. Is. Coming now to the economic measures, we have a, a, a minister of economy who is a ultra liberal uh, minister. Uh, and, and his first reaction to the pandemic last year was, well, we have to accelerate the reforms. Instead of thinking about emergency plans to deal with the crisis, he was opportunistically trying to, uh, to avoid dialogues and making uh, reforms, opening up the economy, uh, liberalizing even more the, the labor market and so on. And then uh, later on, a decree of calamity uh, approved by, by the, the Congress enabled the government to make some counter-cyclical measures. And the most important, I brought here some, uh, some of them were really uh, similar to those made in India or in other emerging economies. So I won't uh, uh, spend my time here. For instance, credit for small enterprise and so on. But the most important one was this one, the emergency income program that was not uh, designed by the government itself. Uh, the government was against this policy, but at the end, they had to approve it. They had to accept it. It was designed by the Congress. And it was a very important program. Uh, it costed something like uh, three to four percent of the GDP last year. Uh, and it provided something like $100 for the, uh, the poorer households for some months, and then at the end, uh, it was cut for half of the benefit, so $50, but it was very important, notably for the poorest uh, extract. You can see in the chart here, it's in Portuguese, I'm sorry about that, but something like 70% of the households uh, earning less than one minimum wage were receiving this emergency income. So it was uh, uh, quite important. One third uh, Brazilian population has something like 210 million people. So one third at the end, one third of the population last year was receiving this emergency income and these cash transfers. I'll try to speed up to do not uh, to respect my time. Uh, but uh, Minister uh, Gaddis, the Minister of Economy, was the whole time saying that it was a temporary uh, cash transfer, and then uh, he would come back to uh, uh, an even stronger austerity policy this year, 2021. And then uh, the, the cash transfers were diminished in terms of the amounts and also in terms of the number of people uh, getting these cash transfers. So now we have something like 45 million people. Uh, Coming to the monetary policy, uh, as Professor Gita showed, we, we have, and, and the last presenter as well, we have in Brazil also an inflation pressure for 2021. The expectations, uh, the, the forecast is 7%. And then we have 
currently a hawkish monetary policy. We had a very quick uh, increase in, in the basic interest rate, which reached currently 5.25% uh, a year, which obviously also is obviously harmful also for the recovery of the economy. Uh, something which is not uh, uh, related to the economy in the short term, but which is related to the economy in the long run, medium to long term, uh, environmental policies. And this is also a catastrophe because uh, within the crisis, in the moments uh, when uh, the, the discussions were all devoted to, to, to COVID-19, uh, the Minister of Environment said that they took they, they should take benefit of this moment of tranquility, his words, tranquility, to go by with the cattle drive. This is an expression in Brazil to say that they should go with the tractors over the environmental legislation, and they are doing it. They are really dismantling the environmental legislation in Brazil, it's taking benefit because the, the focus of the media is in other areas. Then the social outcomes, not surprising. We had a, a decline in the GDP last year, which was 4%. Some estimations say that if we, we didn't have the emergency income program, it would be something between 8 and 14%. And then the impacts in the labor market are quite dramatic. The unemployment rate do not express it. It's 14% now. But we have to take into consideration that many persons are due to just uh, abandoning the, the search for jobs. So we have a very, we had a minus 8 million jobs in the last year, uh, this year compared to last year, but we have something like 6 million people in situation of unemployment hidden due to discouragement. Uh, which means a 25% increase uh, compared to last year. And something like 30% of the workers, they are working less than they would uh, will uh, and uh, than they, they, they can. So it's a kind of hidden unemployment as well. Food insecurity, uh, it's a shame in a country like Brazil to have food insecurity, as you know, and uh, it, 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 uh, the situation got really, really worse this year. So something like 55% of our population is with uh, any degree of food insecurity, uh, being 9% uh, of them with high food insecurity. And then I'm coming to the end of my presentation. Bolsonaro, during this, uh, well, within this context, obviously his approval is uh, getting is declining. And the persons approving his government now are 34 percent, and 63 percent do not approve his government. Uh, which means the next year we have elections that he has, he, he is now trying to, 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 his whole energy is devoted uh, to keep the power next year. So he's systematically defending and taking part in demonstrations against the Congress and the Supreme Court, making allusions to the possibility of not organizing the elections next year because he is uh, somehow admitting that he can lose the elections. Today, some, some hours ago, uh, we had a, a military uh, parade in Brasilia because today we have important uh, votation in our Congress related to the elections precisely. And then uh, incidentally, obviously this is not incidental, but you have a military parade in, in, in Brasilia to show the population that uh, Bolsonaro is really uh, thinking about the possibility of not organizing an election and, and, and uh, somehow we have the risk of another coup d'etat. Then uh, the situation, the sanitary situation is getting better. Uh, we still, uh, do, but we still do not know the whole, uh, the, the, the full effects of the Delta variant. So we have a decline in the effects, in the, the infections. And we have uh, the path of vaccination is, uh, well, it's still slow, but we have 20% uh, of the population full vaccinated and half with at least one shot. Final remarks. Uh, challenges for peripheral countries. Uh, I just put it here. I won't have time to, to deepen it, but we can do it in the, in the Q&A session. Uh, the structural problems of the periphery of the world are getting deeper. So external vulnerability, vulnerability lack of autonomy for anti-cyclical policies, dependency on the core countries for economic recovery and inequalities. And in the case of Brazil, we have some legacies for the short term, the deaths, uh, more than half a million deaths 
people with starving, nine, uh, 20 million people, 9% of the population, plus people with food insecurity, uh, 20 million people unemployed, uh, 30 million people working less than their will possibilities. And for, for the long term, we have a, a precarization of the labor market, dismantlement of the environmental legislation and national economy even more vulnerable. Sorry uh, if I uh, talk at more than 10 minutes. Thank you very much. And I'm ready for the discussions. Well, thank you very much, Professor Di Conti, for this uh, uh, very thought-provoking and uh, uh, pre presentation that, that puts developments in Brazil, also in the broader political economy uh, context. Um, now, we are now going to turn to to the next speaker. Um, and I, I just should say something that I should have said at the beginning, that um, our colleague um, from, from Russia, Professor Grigoriev, was unfortunately unable to join due to unforeseen uh, personal circumstances. But we're very happy now to uh, to move to the third panelist, uh, uh, panelist and that is uh, uh, Professor uh, Markram El Shaghi, who holds the position of a professor at Henan University in China and is also director of the Center for Financial Development and Stability. Prior to that, he was a visiting associate professor at California State University, Long Beach, uh, as, law, as well as senior economist at the Halle Institute for Economic Research, IWH, where he was a research uh, professor uh, in January 2015. His research focuses on uh, monetary economics, uh, econometrics, and international macroeconomics. And so now we're looking forward to his presentation on China. Please, you have the floor. Uh, hello, thanks for a uh, lot for your uh, kind introduction and having me. I have to apologize, I'm obviously at home, not in an office. It's like 10 p.m. in China now. So, uh, well, that's my dog, that's my table. That's me. So I'm the German guy from uh, China. I feel a little bit bad for being here because like, honestly, we are doing fine. So after hearing all those horrible stories from India and even more so Brazil, I feel that really like, well, I, I can't really compete um, with that because yeah. So now I have to find the button that says share screen. Ah, here it is. Um, screen. So um, this is a very short presentation. Um, so it's three slides. So I'm just going to uh, chat a little bit um, uh, most of the time. So the COVID recession in China was really short. Um, it looked really bad, and that's, I think, what a lot of media initially reported, because it kind of fell together with the Chinese New Year break uh, in 2020. So unlike most Western countries, where the big um, change uh, in the business cycle happens in December for Christmas, basically, China just shuts down in early spring, which might actually also be the reason why the consequences at the end turn out to not be that bad, because the biggest shutdown basically happened at a time where China is shut down anyways. So we really only had one pretty bad quarter. Even by summer, we were kind of back to track. And so the gray lines you see here, uh, so that's real GDP. The gray lines you see are the 7% growth rate, which is pretty much what is like considered what's often dubbed the new normal which the Chinese government typically has as a growth target after the financial crisis. Um, and basically, by, even by December last year, China was not only back to the original level before the crisis, but actually back to the original growth path. So I guess really the question is, what's the difference between China and other countries? Um, and I have to admit, I'm like COVID uh, or health economics are not my specialty, but in this case, I might actually not be that bad because being from Germany, but living in China, I 
kind of keep a close eye in, on what's happening in both countries. And the differences could not be more stark. And actually, Germany is kind of a very representative of what's happening um, in actually quite a few uh, developed countries. And what I believe contributed a lot to the problems there. Um, which for me, to be honest, are uh, almost inconceivable because the emerging markets have the excuse of being poor and, for example, not being able to afford vaccinations, but that's kind of hard to defend in a country like Germany. Um, so I'm basically going to talk about two things. What's different in China's response to the health crisis? What's different in China's response to the economic crisis? But I do frankly think that the first one probably is um, the more relevant for the Chinese success in the crisis. So most countries try to minimize the intensity of restrictions, not necessarily to the crazy extent that Bolsonaro did in Brazil, as Bruno has just told us. But even if you look at Germany, there were like lockdowns. So again, this is like very anecdotal evidence. But when I talk to my parents like, oh yeah, I heard you're in lockdown. They said, oh yeah, like we are in lockdown now. They said, you should not go out unless you have to work, to work or wanna go for a walk to exercise or wanna meet friends. So that was kind of the lock, type of lockdown Germany typically had at least in 2020 most of the time when they had lockdowns. So in consequence, the lockdown that was not terribly bad but still economically hurting basically was perpetually renewed intensified, lessened a bit, intensified again, because at any point they tried to go for minimal restrictions. China from the very beginning had a zero COVID strategy, which is actually particularly interesting because it started in China. So at the point when it was even noticed that something has to be done on a larger scale, there were a couple thousand cases in China and a few dozens in the rest of the world. So what, what China did is basically take the geographical area where it's bad, do a hard lockdown as short as possible, but also as long as necessary. So minimize the time, but keep it strict. And as soon as anything pops up, it's happening again. So I'm currently living in what is considered in China to be a, a COVID hotspot. So I'm in Kaifeng here, which is right next to Zhengzhou, which is one of the worst affected cities in China those days, uh, which means they have a huge epidemic of roughly 50 cases. In Kaifeng, I think we are now at five. Um, and basically we are under lockdown. And this lockdown will just go for a couple weeks. And in this couple weeks, over the course of three weeks, the entire population of both Zhengzhou and Kaifeng, which in total is about 15 million people, will be tested repeatedly. So I think the current planning is to do it six times, entire population of two cities over three weeks. By then, you know there is nothing and everything goes back to normal. And actually it starts doing so gradually after the first rounds of tests show that actually kind of it's all under control. So you start relatively big, lock a city down, then narrow it down to districts or even individual communities. And over the past year, that has actually worked very well. 90% of the time, the vast majority, or pretty much all of the time, the vast majority of China is free to do whatever they like. But when it happens, there's a real crackdown. And so far, that has worked uh, very well. Of course, like this uh, strategy is basically impossible to replicate um, once you lost control over the situation. And from what I'm aware of, the only other countries really doing that uh, more or less successfully are basically island nations that have a much easier time to um, isolate themselves. So what's the difference in the economic reaction? Well, I guess um, that partly goes in the direction of what is sometimes a critically dubbed state capitalism. But the thing that China is kind of more involved in policymaking. 
for their check notices. Does any, am I not heard or something horrible and I'm just talking? I can't open the chat for a strange reason. If I cannot be heard, just tell me. Um, anyways, so what did China do in terms of the economic consequences? As I said, it was much more targeted because China typically is much more involved. So what you saw in a lot of countries was a massive increase in deficit spending and a continuation of a very loose monetary policy that has pretty much been going on since the financial crisis. And China, while responding strongly, it was much more moving funds around than just increasing. Don't get me wrong, there still was a massive increase. The Chinese deficit rose to, I think, 3.6% uh, of GDP last year. So there was basically uh, a stimulus package of around 3 trillion uh, RMB, which is like a 500 billion US dollars. So it was a huge program. Um, but actually a huge part of that program was 2 billion um, tax cuts. So you might ask then, where does the rest of the program come from um, that is so targeted? Well, it mostly comes from the government sector. So China pretty much had the entire set of um, methods to economically combat COVID that was listed in the first uh, of the presentations on India. So there were subsidies, there was financial support for uh, households, the whole shebang. But at the same time, like the government sector itself shrank. So, and it pains me to say that because I work at a university, but that was probably a good thing. So our university had real budget trouble last year, but most of the enterprises, most of the little companies in Kaifeng survived um, the crisis relatively well, which I think is worth, uh, worth mentioning. And this way China could basically do a massive intervention and at the same time kind of keep its reserves to still be able to react. Because that's what we saw in Europe, even after the financial crisis, many countries were basically unable to do as much as they should have done now and relied on the European Union, especially in the European periphery, because they were still suffering from the consequences of what they did to respond to the financial crisis. And so in chi China has been very careful to not get into that situation with its stimulus packages by trying to kind of, well, definitely not keep a balanced budget, but still keep deficit spending to a minimum. And it followed a similar strategy in terms of monetary policy. So what China did, uh, so China, unlike the US and a bunch of other countries, still use I'm hearing a lot of music from somewhere. I don't know. I think that's you. I don't know. Anyway, so what China still uses um, required reserve ratios much more than pretty much all Western uh, central banks. So depending on the type of bank, we are still talking between 10 and 20% required reserve ratio. And there has been a series of cuts over the past year. But what China also, what diff also differs China from many other countries is that the required reserve ratio is not the same for all financial institutions. So for example, this time it has been specifically, the most of the rounds of lowering have been specifically targeted at rural banks where like, especially small enterprises had like a lot of problems and like those small enterprises often go to the rural banks. So it was again, very targeted. Um, and uh, so our Institute does monetary policy reports. And actually for every single quarter, if you look at the total monetary policy and stance, uh, monetary policy stance of China, it was only mildly expansionary. And again, at the same time, they managed to push similar magnitude as the financial stimulus, push around 3 trillion RMB into the most heavily hit sectors um, during the COVID pandemic, while at the same time keeping their previous objectives in mind, which is uh, preventing an overheating of the housing market, preventing another stock market bubble, 
and so on and so forth. So in general, macroprudential policy was intensified. They kept combating the, what's it called, the shadow banking, which has been a major issue over the past years. So, um, and again, this is very hard to replicate outside the Chinese system, which, um, because in the Chinese system, as you probably know, the four major banks are all state owned, um, like actually by the central government. And many of the smaller banks are still state owned in a wider sense. They're owned by uh, municipalities and so on and so forth. So it's much more easy to intervene. Uh, but so far that strategy has worked uh, very well for China. And uh, that's basically all I had to say. I think those are the key differences so I do think China is kind of special because uh, it actually went fairly well through the crisis, although the crisis originated here. Um, but again, it was a lot using strategies that are not easy to replicate in other economic systems. Thanks a lot. And like Bruno, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might or might not have. Thank you very much for that fascinating look into uh, China's strategy and again highlighting the differences uh, with uh, what we've seen elsewhere. Um, so uh, now let's turn to, to the last uh, presenter, panelist, um, and that is Professor Harun Borat, uh, who is a pr professor of economics and director of the Development Policy Research Unit at the University of Cape Town. His research interests cover labor economics, poverty, and income distribution. Um, he's a member of the Presidential Economic Advisory Council and holds the highly prestigious National Research Chair under the theme of economic growth, poverty, and inequality, exploring the interactions for South Africa. It's a real pleasure to have you with us, and uh, please, um, you have the floor. Thanks very much, uh, Petya. And uh, given your sound failure, can you just wave to me if you can hear me? Uh, okay, excellent. Um, as you may have guessed from the wonderful introduction, I'm not a macroeconomist, so more of a labor economist. And in many ways, that's going to define my, my short input. Uh, at the speed of light, I've got about 20 slides. I'm going to try and take you through uh, sort of early impressions uh, from COVID-19 with respect to the economic consequences with a, with a sub-focus, uh, as I said, on, on the labor market. So in essence, I'm really going to try and do four things, but, it is, but, but, but it's mainly the first two, which is try and give you an overview of uh, the, the, the macroeconomic consequence uh, before going on to the labor market figures that we've seen for South Africa in terms of the employment effects, in terms of some early evidence around uh, inequality, particularly wage inequality. And then in turning to President Ramaphosa's stimulus package, I want to open that up a little bit and question the impact and the targeting of uh, the stimulus package with a focus on social assistance. This seems like a macro heavy uh, uh, set of inputs. So I'll, I'll be very brief on some of the macro numbers that you're seeing with respect to South Africa's deficit uh, uh, numbers. So now, and, and then finally, a little bit around where I think our policy needs to move with respect to dealing with the longer term consequences of COVID. Here's, a, here's just a quick overview of, uh, and I've included the, the uh, BRICS countries as well, the China data, this is from our world in data. The China data, our colleague from China should uh, give us some better numbers. These, these are not great, but you can see in many ways South Africa, if I just get my laser pointer up, um, South Africa and India seem to move almost in concert with each other. So South Africa, uh, India's had that big wave over there and South Africa is currently in the midst of our third wave. In terms of infection, still much lower than say the UK, but very much bunched up close to our, our, our Brazilian and Indian neighbors with Russia slightly lower. I'm not, I'm not an epidemiologist by any stretch, but I think where we moved as a country is a rapid uh, uptick in our vaccination program for, from a very, very slow start. That's essentially driven by heavy involvement of the private sector. So what do the growth figures look like? So originally 
before COVID struck, um, the projections from our National Treasury, which our Ministry of Finance was about 0.9. So still anemic growth rate. South Africa is sort of the poster child for being in a middle income country growth trap. But 0.9% was where we were at. And then following, um, following the uh, pandemic, we had, if you look at the National Treasury, the Ministry of Finance forecast, which pretty much came through at 7% was the massive contraction you saw. I think um, the uh, presentation from the IMF chief, chief economist confirms that we were very on par, if you like, relative to other emerging markets. The bounce back projected for South Africa is about 2.6% for 2021, uh, so still well below net terms where we should be. So what have been, for me, what's of interest is what's been the labor market fallout. Um, and, and I want to sort of emphasize the fact that one does need to, one does need to think about, um, sorry, if I could just get rid of the, if one does need to think about the distribution across the quarters, right? So I've compared our job growth rates uh, relative to, for example, sorry, let me just, um, so I'm just having a technology glitch here. If you just give me one second. Um, so I've tried to compare our, our um, job growth rate over the quarters of, let's call it the COVID year relative to 2019. So the solid line is 2019, and these are the four quarters for 20, um, uh, 2020. And what's very clear is the nonlinear shift. So you had this massive dip from the first to the second quarter of, um, of uh, uh, over close to 2 million jobs, but then a strong recovery. And so what happens end to end over 2020 is a net job loss of about 1.4 million. And that's a decrease of about 8%. A simple elasticity suggests a fairly elastic response relative to the growth contraction. But the key thing is we've lost 1.4 million jobs. Uh, by way of comparison, in the Great Recession, the decline was about, um, about uh, just under uh, a million jobs. So this in a relative context, relative to the fourth quarter of 2008, with the great financial crisis has been a massive hit to an economy, if many of you know, uh, that has, uh, pre-crisis had one of the highest unemployment rates in the world. One of the interesting things though, as a labor economist, we never look at this, was what happened at the intensive margin. So effectively, this is the percentage of workers that reported working zero hours. So in other words, what employers and firms did was to keep workers employed, but in fact, told them to stay at home. And so there's a spike in zero hours of work to about 15% of the workforce in the second quarter. That's when COVID uh, strikes. And then it basically, it, it basically normalizes by the end of the year. So you've got this massive jump in zero hours being worked and then uh, a decline um, uh, back to normal levels compared to the 2019 figures. Um, we ask the question about those who did not lose their jobs, right? So retain their jobs, what happened to their wages? Because of course, the other thing that happened, again, an intensive of margin shift was a retention of employment, but a decline in wages. And so what you see here is uh, we, we've tried in this particular uh, graphic is to look at wage shifts across the distribution. So the 10th percentile through to the 90th percentile, but uh, again, across the quarters with the red dotted line representing uh, the COVID shock. So what you see interestingly is that the biggest decline, right, is actually for workers in the 90th percentile of the wage distribution and then the 75th percentile. And thankfully, actually, you see, f you see lower declines in employment, sorry, in wages, for uh, workers at the bottom end of the distribution. What about wage inequality? So we asked the question uh, uh, in terms of uh, well, wage inequality on the right, job losses and the source of job losses. So again, thinking about what types of workers lost their jobs, and I'll come to that in a bit more detail in the next few slides. But in essence, we've located households that these workers reside in by, uh, by the percentile of the wage, right? So the poorest 20% of households see the biggest shock, right, in uh, employment relative to the first quarter of 2020. And that's a very consistent pattern, but the largest shock is for households uh, in the poorest 20% uh, of the distribution. Uh, 
what happened to the genie. So you look at the wage genie, if you look at these little figures here, 0.55, then a massive increase in wage inequality, but then it normalizes and pretty much declines to uh, close to Q1 levels um, by, by, by the fourth quarter of 2020. So again, the, 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 the sort of patterns seem to be nonlinear. You've got this big shock in jobs, and then a gradual uptick, a big shock in zero hours, and then a gradual uptick and a normalization of zero hours. And the same seems to be true, at least initially, uh, for wage inequality levels. Now, I, and I'm here I'm taking a slightly different time period because we, we're still cleaning the data. But if I take this, if I, if I normalize by quarter, so if I look at the second quarter of 2019 against the second quarter of 2020, which is sort of the heart of the first wave of COVID, if you like, I asked the question, what happened to employment by standard characteristics? The bullet points on the right probably summarize it quite well. 67% of our jobs uh, that were lost emanate from the tertiary sectors, but note that that is an under uh, weight relative to their share pre-COVID. So in other words, the majority, a disproportionate share of jobs were actually lost in manufacturing um, and in the construction sector. Likewise, a disproportionate share of jobs were actually lost among semi-skilled workers and unskilled workers, not surprising. When we break it down by, by gender, race, and age, and formality, some of the really interesting statistics for me lie in the, in the um, formal informal distinction. South Africa not only has the highest rates of unemployment in the world, but actually one of the lowest rates of informality. I'll repeat that, one of the lowest rates of informality. And so what you find is, for example, only 17% of our workforce are actually in the informal sector, but they accounted for 37% of all jobs lost due to COVID. Um, and, and therefore, an underweight of jobs lost in the formal sector, a, a disproportionate share of jobs lost amongst domestic services, so household domestic workers, and of course, most of the jobs lost are in the private sector. Almost no union members, uh, in fact, lose their jobs. And that's another important, uh, important uh, uh, point in, in a highly unionized uh, labor market like South Africa. Well, based on my data, and I know um, my Indian colleague has slightly different, so we should compare and contrast. These are IMF data. We come up with a very strong team. We look at us compared to other emerging markets, certainly in the BRIC sample, we have uh, one of the highest down there, but uh, in terms of time, so Hello. Yeah. Am I back? Yeah, we can see you now. Uh, we can see you now. You'll have to load up your presentation again. Continue to share. Are you sharing your screen? 
Pity, I think uh, he must be out. I think his connection is weak. We can we can continue then the discussion. Up. I don't can. Uh, Shall I stop? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Please, please go ahead. Okay. Um, so in the interest of time and connection so these are this is sort of the targeting of the of the grants uh as i said these all of these except the last two were already in place um uh pre covid so the president doubles up on these grants and just this just shows you the targeting of these grants in other words very well targeted uh strongly anti poor the covid grant perhaps less so but remembering that the COVID grant was explicitly targeted at the unemployed and those in the informal sector who may have actually lost their jobs and in some cases may actually have been made worse off by the grants, uh, by, by, by COVID. Um, let, me, let me just quickly move on to the macro fallout. Uh, these, I find this a fascinating graph of the evolution of South Africa's um, debt dynamics. So this was the original pre-COVID deficit to GDP ratio at 6.8% for South Africa, which was uh, already very well managed historically, but under the state capture years of President Zuma, in fact, this starts to eke up. So this was already... Yeah, I think uh, this connection has been out, I guess. I'm afraid we were having yeah. some issues again with the sound. Uh, you're back, Haron? Yeah, I'm back. Maybe I'll, I'll I'll just go to the last slide. I mean, these were so essentially 1.4 million jobs lost. Um, very few jobs lost for union members and public sector employees. Uh, we worried about the deficit, as I've said, but it's come down dramatically because of the resource windfall. Uh, and I think the macro management challenge going forward is about improving efficiency of spending. That's what's said in the slide. the support towards households and social assistance. And I think uh, uh, a greater support needs to pivot towards firms on the supply side, if you like. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I know it was uh, these uh, technical difficulties are uh, unpredictable, but I think we, we managed to get a very good overview of uh, developments in South Africa, and also I think the emphasis on the labor market was particularly useful. Um, so, so with that, um, if we can now turn to the uh, questions and answers uh, part of this um, session. Um, I, I see that some of you have already put questions. I would encourage again, if anybody else has uh, questions to, to put them in in the chat. Um, and there are quite a few of them that are uh, related to China. So perhaps we can start from there. Um, so one question is, uh, to what extent what's happened in China has been a result of the fact that it's a manufacturing hub? So how much of that has played a role in, in managing the COVID uh, spread? There are also other questions related to the initial response and uh, um, of the pandemic. So if I can uh, ask uh, perhaps uh, Professor Shaggy to, to start there. And of course, if anybody else uh, would like to, to come in, uh, they're more, more than welcome to. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so I don't think that China being a manufacturing hub plays too much of a role. I mean, it does, of course, in the sense that China is not a really poor country, but so is none of the other BRICs. So, I mean, we, we are not talking, I don't know, Somalia here, like where there is just nothing to go around. Like, um, But I think it's a lot just that, um, well, when a decision is made, it's executed swiftly and it's just done. So it's not, a lot of things can just be handled like in, in like record time. Like if, if something like that happens in Germany, until even like the decision is made and then announced, maybe just, let, me, let me do it another way. Like uh, just a very like, again, anecdotal example. So when you do a lockdown in Germany or anywhere in Europe, pretty much, what happens is that, okay, we discussed that. So now we need to give you time to prepare. So we start a lockdown on Wednesday, next week, Wednesday. And then what happens is that next week, Tuesday, people go for Corona parties because that's the last chance to hit the pub. If China wants to do a lockdown, you wake up and you find a sign on your door that says your community is under lockdown now. And that just happened like a few, that just happens a few hours after cases are discovered. So it's just a very, very quick process. And that of course makes those things easier because just in that one week where you have time to like do whatever you like, Basically, then this like quick and harsh response window is, is gone. Then you cannot do that anymore. Then the infection is already spread. Um, otherwise, like I think it's like small thing. So uh, it's really um, basically when this testing happens, it's actually fascinating. So, so again, I'm just talking about personal experience now. So basically they just go through the city. So it's not that you go to a hospital, but they literally ship a bunch of doctors and nurses to every larger community in the city, one by one. Your like little community or your building, if you live in a big community, gets a time slot and they tell you, be there at two. And like there is again, not a hospital like half an hour away, but it's like five minutes walking at most. Then you go there, there's a line, you get tested. They test like 10 people together with one test kit because Again, that only makes sense because they did the zero COVID strategy from the very beginning. So they know the outcome will be 99.9% .9 of negative tests. So they basically just do 10 together. And if there should be a positive one, they retest those 10 in that one test, which makes it relatively cheap. Of course, once you have 20% of infected people or so, this hugely cost-saving measure doesn't work at all anymore. Right, um, but so that's how they can now do that relatively quickly and um, efficiently. On the information thing at the very beginning, I have kind of mixed feelings. So I do think there obviously is incentive for like local administrators to cover up things because well, they will be held responsible. But on the other side, I think this whole debate about like what was, what information was given out at what time is a lot like the benefit of hindsight. Right? Like if, if you look again, look at Germany with the huge debates that you have when we say, oh, we have to like close restaurants for a couple of weeks. Like politicians get voted out of office for that. So obviously when you have like four or five or even 10, 20 sick people in your city, you hesitate a lot to say, oh, I think we have a global pandemic coming or even a city epidemic and should close down the city. So you wait until you're sure. Sadly, by the time you're sure, it's also too late because again, then people are infected and pretty much has learned its lesson. And ever since Wuhan, so China in total has like 100,000 cases, right? Like over the entire epidemic since beginning of 2020. And essentially 80,000 of those 100,000 were in Wuhan alone, the city where it started which shows how bad it is once it gets out of control. So China has learned this lesson the hard way. Um, but I don't, yeah, 
I think, it's, again, it's mostly the benefit of hindsight that now we know it is a pandemic, it is highly infectious. So it was a thing you should have warned people about, but nobody wanted to be the first to like cry wolf. Um, and I guess that's an intense ince incentive structure you could have found in many countries. But of course, I don't know. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think there are quite a few other questions and uh, perhaps I can maybe group some of them. Um, there are a number of questions about the, um, I guess the way I would characterize it is the, uh, the differential impact of the crisis in urban versus rural areas. Uh, may I just ask maybe each one of you to, to, to say a few words about that and what, what is your take on, on, on the issue? Uh, and perhaps we can um, we can start with uh, Bruno. Would you like to start? Okay, it's a very good question, and actually, it, it's an important question for us to evaluate the effects of the crisis all over time as well, comparative effects, because uh, many persons do uh, comparisons on the effects of the current crisis with the global financial crisis, which is recent, but also with 29, for instance, 1929. And obviously, it's interesting to make this kind of comparison. But then when we go into the real effects over the population, one of the, the key uh, questions is precisely uh, the, the, the degree of uh, well, questions related to the labor market, as uh, Harun Murat was trying to explore. I'm not a specialist on labor market, but then uh, also related to, to this uh, urban, degree of urbanization, right? And then coming back to the question, uh, in Brazil, we have uh, something like 15% of the population in the rural areas. So it, it's not that high. Uh, but uh, then I, I would say that this population is less affected by the crisis because obviously they still have access to, to living uh, conditions, I mean, to, to, to get their own crops. Uh, whilst in, in the big cities like uh, Sao Paulo, Brasilia or Rio de Janeiro, and the big cities in the world, uh, this informal sector is, is quite important. And uh, obviously, those persons from from one week to the following week, they just uh, had no conditions to, to to get any kind of income. And then, uh, uh, what happened in Brazil was uh, an increasing criminality as well uh, due to this lack of food, uh, starvation. Okay, that's why this emergency income program was so important. It, it took some time. Uh, to be established because it was designed by the Congress and then um, it, it was designed also using apps, uh, cell phone apps, and then we, we have another kind of literacy, illiteracy, as you know, and in Brazil, this, this digital illiteracy, so uh, a non-negligible part of the population was not able to deal with these apps. So it took, let's say, one month, one month between uh, the, the outbreak of the crisis in Brazil and uh, the, 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 the cash transfers. So uh, in this one month, uh, the, the situation was terrible, mostly coming back to the question for the urban, poor and urban population. Thank you very much. Anybody else would like to come in on this question? Sure. Oh, sorry. Um, yes. Uh, how about we start with uh, um, so South Africa first, and then and then we can move on. Yeah. So I think I mean uh, it's an interesting question because the I think the effects on rural areas were heterogeneous, right? So so if you think of health access, right, that clearly. Um, in terms of access to clinics, water and sanitation, it's very clearly the case that rural areas would have been far more disadvantaged in South Africa relative to urban areas, right? Um, the vaccination rollout is primar primarily in urban areas, um, water and sanitation shortages and access problems and challenges lie in rural areas. So that's very, very clear. It's an interesting question about the um, economic consequences, right? Because most of your jobs um, are in urban areas, and in fact, most of the social assistance is biased towards the vulnerable in rural areas. So if you double up on your social insurance and social assistance, which is what the president did, and uh, the COVID grant, which was for the unemployed, that's disproportionately going to benefit rural areas, 
So it's an interesting kind of um, outcome. I don't think anybody's carefully looked at this. Uh, so, so the way I think the mental model is let's look at the economic shocks and who was made most worse off by the grant. And it's essentially, in my view, would be those who were employed uh, in, and they'd predominantly be in urban areas. Um, so I think you may have this kind of strange outcome where the health effects were more negative in rural areas, but the economic effects would have actually probably played itself out um, uh, more negatively in urban areas, for South Africa at least. Yeah. Thank you. And now, who would like to go next? <laughs> speak about the Indian case, uh, the, um, uh, so when, you know, the, the uh, lockdown last year uh, was, was a nationwide lockdown starting on March 25, and then there was a lot of migration uh, of, of, of migrant workers back to their, uh, to their to various regions in which they lived, and that was basically the face of COVID around the world. Um, so the food security part was dealt with by, so we have an ambitious National Food Security Act, which covers roughly 800 million people. It's a population of 1.4 billion people. Um, uh, 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 so I think it's 75% of, 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 of the rural population, 50% of the urban population are covered under this act. And so the way to, to deal with food was that you get uh, 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 X number of kilograms of you know white rice, wheat, cereal, and so on. Um, that was doubled, and then the duration uh, uh, for which that was given was also extended. So that was the food part that led to a rise in food subsidies and, and had you know uh, uh, macro fiscal kind of implications. But I think that it's, it's the kind of urban part and the urban poor, of course, are also eligible for this. But that's where um, and and there's now an interesting debate in India about whether a similar uh, 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 welfare state type labor market intervention should be there for uh, urban households as well. Uh, should there be a, an urban employment guarantee program that provides sector, not only uh, uh, through, through the provision of food. So India also has a, uh, a seasonal kind of a distress unemployment program that guarantees 100 days of, of, of employment to, to, to the poor. Um, and this was extended both on the intensive margin and the extensive margin. So in other words, um, the number of days in which you were eligible for it rose and then uh, uh, and the number of members also rose. So, um, so there are a variety of interventions. I think these were, for the urban, um, they were less, they were less well-defined and, and therefore the hit on the urban, uh, urban population on the urban poor was much, much more stark. And so there's, there, there's an interesting case to be made for uh, whether there should be similar institutions for, 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 the urban, for the urban setup. And unlike South Africa, a bulk of the workforce is informal in India. I was very surprised to see that 17% number. Uh, uh, it, you know, in, in India, it's, 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 it's close to 80, 85% of, of the labor force is informal. Um, uh, and, I, and I didn't talk about the labor market outcomes in part because I'm trying to make sense of it. So something called a periodic labor force survey. We now have three rounds of it. And if I remember correctly, when I saw it, um, it actually showed that um, both labor force partition, participation rates rose uh, 17, 18, 18, 19, 19, 20 through the, through the pandemic. Um, uh, although the, the, the number of people reporting self-employment also rose. So it could just be that that you know the composition of, 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 of the type of work that people were doing deteriorated markedly. Uh, it went through uh, non-agricultural kind of informal type jobs, uh, suggesting distress and, and, and for that for that fraction of the population. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, would you like to add anything on China? Yeah, a little bit. Uh... The thing is in China, and I think that's the reason why the government very strongly focused on giving support to rural regions, or basically when I say rural, it's actually not even the official distinction between urban and rural that exists in China, um, but more, more kind of the hinterlands versus the fairly rich uh, Eastern seaboard. Because uh, the Chinese economy is really dominated by this internal migration with the migrant workers who whose families stay behind in the hinterland, so kind of all the western parts of China go to the big cities, work, and send money home. So when basically internal migration was shut down for a few months, uh, 
in the one big wave, like basically when there were those 80,000 cases in Wuhan, they were hit fairly hard. And in terms of economic consequences, that was probably one of the worst. So that's where like a lot of, especially the early government intervention um, went to. Um, and th then after that, like after the first wave, it was really usually very, very kind of surgical uh, interventions that like one city is closed down. And, th and that of course pretty much never happened in a rural area, but still because of that migration thing, economically they were hit quite hard initially. Thank you. And uh, there are a lot of uh, questions left, but we are running out of time. So uh, what I'm just gonna do is perhaps ask you one last question and I'll, I'll ask all of the panelists the same question and I'll ask you to, to, uh, to keep your answers to a few sentences. But the question is, um, what is, do you expect your, your economy, the, the economy of your respective country uh, to come out, in, in what position do you expect it to come out after the crisis? Uh, do you think there'll be a, a permanent impact or in the other direction, do you think it could actually come out stronger uh, from this crisis? And perhaps we'll start in the order that you spoke at the beginning. So um, perhaps we can start with India. Yeah, so that's a good question. I think that the hysteresis part of it really depends on your policy choices. I mean, if you bundle up, then you're going to see uh, 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 lower trend growth as you grow forward. I mean, if you, India's kind of high growth period in the 2000s was driven by uh, uh, high investment, high exports, uh, high credit growth. Um, and, and I think the key now is really to, um, uh, to try and see how, you know, how we can attract more foreign direct investment, how we can raise investment, investment rates. So I think close to 2000 India's investment to GDP was about 24%. And then the high growth rates was about 35, 36%. And now it's gone back down to about 27%. So it does a, you know, a kind of inverse U. And, and, and that's why in some of the final thoughts that I put up, it's going to matter so issues like trade, uh, 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 you know, once you start putting tariffs on your supply chains, I mean, on the one hand, you want to attract foreign direct investment, but on the other hand, you're putting on tariffs. Um, health is going to determine uh, uh, how resilient your, your population is to future waves. Uh, uh, I mean, financial investors are no longer talking about herd immunity, they're talking about herd resilience because there's going to be variants and there's going to be new waves. Uh, uh, so, so it really is, the, the permanent hysteresis effects depends on, 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 the, on the policies you, you enact. And, and, and the policies you enact are also kind of pinned down by uh, how much monetary and fiscal policy space you have. That's, that's that, partly, that partly constrains you. I, I think no central bank wants to be responsible uh, and print their way out of this. And uh, no government wants to, you know, um, uh, 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 borrow uh, and face the wrath of financial markets. I, I, I think, and those are active areas of discussion right now. But within that, you it's a tight, tight balancing act between prioritizing health, uh, letting investment come in, raising tax revenues. Now, whether you raise tax revenues through, you know, uh, 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 getting better at this investing, privatizing, and so on, uh, those are all things that national economies need to need to decide. But it will depend on the kind of. And, and being an optimist, I hope we do we do get out of this properly, and we and we will hopefully. But but it is it is a tight balancing act. Thank you. And now Brazil. Okay, well, very quickly, uh, I'm very, very pessimistic, and I guess in my presentation I gave the reasons for that. Uh, but in a few words, one could expect the, the crisis to, uh, to stimulate a change, for instance, in the environmental policy. Uh, this is not the case in Brazil. One could expect it to, to have policies to reshore industry, 
This is not the case in Brazil. We have no policies for that. Uh, one could expect that the crisis would uh, create a more uh, regional sentiments or, or the creation of regional value chains. This is not the case in Brazil. We have no policies for that. So uh, what I see as the outcome of the crisis is, is a, a, an even more vulnerable country, both in, in social and economic uh, terms. So I'm very, very pessimistic, unfortunately. Thank you. And now, China? Well, I am carefully optimistic. Um, I mean, now basically the big question is if the Chinese strategy that proved effective with the initial COVID outbreak still works with the uh, uh, Corona, uh, with the Delta variant that recently came to China. Um, so there have been the first few cases. We are doing the same thing that we have done before and that worked well. Um, so hoping that the uh, increased uh, infectiousness is not so bad that this doesn't work. Um, I think uh, China will uh, come out of this in a relatively um, strong position. All right, and last but not least, South Africa. So back seven percent recover about three maybe four percent next year. Uh, we're probably back to where we started in eighteen months, right? In pure growth terms. Bigger the bigger challenge. Um, the bigger challenge is the, the bigger challenge is really around the long run growth constraints that we face. Um, so if you look at both um, you know issues such as crime, uh, labor regulations, skills constraints, competition policy. All of that translates into an investment to GDP ratio that's much lower than all the countries uh, in BRICS, all the other countries and most emerging markets. So that's the long run challenge. Uh, so whether we can institute shifts and changes to the investment regime, let's call it that, uh, for, for long run growth is the bigger question for me, um, almost independent of, of the evolution of the pandemic. Thanks. Well, thank you very much and thank you for to all of you for your uh, participation, for your insights, for uh, everything that, that, that you've contributed to this discussion. It's tough to summarize and to, uh, to come up with a bottom line, but I'll just try to, try to do this in a few words. Um, and I guess the first point that emerges is the, is the fact that the path of the pandemic has been different across countries and the strategies have also differed. Uh, but at the same time, we've also seen a variety of policy, macroeconomic policy responses. And while those had made things a bit better than they would have been without them, uh, we still see a, a very unequal effects within, uh, within economies. Um, and many of you also pointed out to risks that are emerging in the, in the, uh, in the period ahead um, related to uh, fiscal accounts. Some of you mentioned corporate issues and of course the structural issues and the importance of also of trade and such going forward. My apologies, I have a very loud German shepherd who is just getting very excited at the moment. Um, and uh, I just wanted to end on some of the lessons that some of you had pointed to. Um, and one is, again, uh, to think more about the impact of cash transfer um, uh, programs on and also the interaction of that in the informal sectors. I think we've gathered quite a lot of experience during this crisis about what works and what, what can work better. And I just want to end in something that uh, we started at uh, the first speaker spoke about, the importance of health spending to think about that is investment in the period ahead. I think this is something that the crisis has shown to us. Um, and with that, I'm going to close this session again with my huge thanks to all of you um, and uh, uh, give the floor back to uh, Professor Dua. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, Chetan, Bruno, Nakron, and Huru, for a comprehensive and thought provoking panel discussion and also an integrated perspective on the BRICS economies. I think we all enjoyed this discussion very much. Thank you. I now request uh, Professor Devendu Net, Delhi School of Economics, to propose a vote of thanks. But before I hand over to him, 
I would like to put on record our deep appreciation for his tireless help and support in organizing this event. Thank you very much, Professor Devyandu Men. And please, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay, so we are almost the last phase of the webinar. So good morning, good noon, good evening, good night to all who have been attending the events from different parts of the world. Indeed, I feel honored and privileged to get opportunity to propose a vote of thanks to the special occasions. Today we have hosted one of the most extensive webinar discussions on the most contemporary issues affecting our life and livelihood. So in the presence of 200 participants in the Zoom meeting and close to 100 viewers on TV. This covers almost 20 countries' representations, and it includes students, research scholars, faculty member, government officials, as well as the representative of various regional and international organizations. On behalf of the Department of Economics, uh, University of Delhi, I thank each of you to make this event a grand success. I convey my regards and heartiest thanks to our chief guest, Professor Gita Gopinath, chief economist of IMF, John Zoenstra, professor of international studies and economics at Harvard University for an insightful talk. I should also thank Vice Chancellor, University of Delhi, Professor P.C. Joshi, Secretary, Minister of Education, Mr. Amit Kare, Director of Delhi School of Economics, Professor Amidwa, who managed to uh, find time to give to attend the inaugural sessions and have been also playing instrumental role in the formation of big network universities collaborations from India. I would also like to thank the panelists, Professor Chetan Ghate uh, from India, Professor Bruno De Canti from Brazil, Markham El Sagi from China, and Arun Mpura from South Africa. Professor Leonid uh, Grewer uh, from Russia, on form but could not join the last minute because of emergency. But uh, he, he, he was planning to be here today. So the speakers shared many in, insight, uh, interesting country experiences, which offers contrast and as well as similarities coming out from the wave that has occurred in which countries. Thanks are also due to Dr. Pitya Kofia Brooks um, for mastering the discussion sessions. Um, but last but not the least, I would like to thank the organic team led by Professor Surender Kumar, our colleague, our staff. I should also not forget thank the uh, IMF communication teams, um, Jennifer Bitten. Kovina, Pakumo, Kuretan, and our IT staffs, Raju, Sandhi, Deepika, others, Mithunjay. And also, I thank the staffs working in the director office and the department office to help us. They put their entire last week into arranging these webinars and offered their account support. Without their support, this event was not possible. Thank you very much once again. I'd also like to thank uh, our big partner in source for popularizing these events, especially Professor Gunodi Kante and the Lawrence Edwards from the, uh, South Africa. I assume to get the similar supports and the stronger followers and any futures. With this, I conclude the webinars and discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. So this brings us to the end of this webinar and panel discussion. We hope that you have enjoyed it and we also plan to organize another webinar very soon. So if you have any suggestions and comments, please do send them to us. Thank you all. Thank you to all the participants, all the speakers and chairs of this session. Have a good day. Thank you.